my name, those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may... All that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known me, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Okay, it's sufficient enough to say, and easy enough to say, this passage is utterly mind-blowing. <laughs> it's an incredible passage. It's extraordinary. And there are a number of different features about the passage that are extraordinary like that. One of them is right at the beginning, um, verse 3. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So right here, this verse. Well, I'm trying to highlight. Um, yeah, there we go. That verse right there. The definition of eternal life. The definition of true life is to know God and to know Jesus, right? We're in the book of John, right? And so all the way through the book of John, we've seen life. In him was life. He is the bread of life. He is the light of life. Okay, so this life theme is a huge thing in all of the gospels, but especially in John. So Jesus is the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? Okay, life is defined as knowing Jesus. Life is defined as knowing God. Um, another extraordinary feature about this, if you go a little further, it's related, actually. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Okay, so how are you and I going to grow and understand and know more and be, what do you say, how are we going to overcome the reality of our sinfulness? There's only one way, truth. We fill our hearts with the truth. We're sanctified through. Uh, one more, I mean, there's so many things we could look at, but one more that's an, just an extraordinary feature of the passage. Um, this concept that we would have relationship with God, we would be made one in terms of unity, love for each other, and we would have relationship with God that he describes even in terms of fellowship, not exactly like the Trinity. I mean, it's not like the Trinity, but but some parallel who would even dare to make the parallel so starting in verse 20 do you realize who he's talking about here he's prayed about the disciples right he's talked about the disciples down to verse 20 and then verse 20 he shifts neither pray i for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word so the question goes who are these others that jesus is praying for who are these people who will believe on me through their word? And you, you can go right there in verse 20. If you could circle that verse and put yourself there. That's me, right? Who are the people who will believe on Jesus through the word of the apostles? Me. Every time I pick up the New Testament and read it, I'm reading the words of the apostles and I'm believing in Jesus. That's me. He's talking about us here, and his prayer is that we would be made one, 
verse 22, even as Jesus and the Father are one, I in them, thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So, you know, I have to be very careful here in how I say and what I say here. But let's just, it's valid enough to say, you've got something going on here where the deep relationship in the Trinity, the Father and the Son, Jesus' intention is that you and I have fellowship. It's not that we join the Trinity, and that goes off in terrible directions, of course. But that we, in some way, are joining in to the richness of this fellowship. Uh, another way to say this, Jesus' relationship with the Father is the oldest relationship that exists in the universe. Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit. This is the oldest, the original relationship. In fact, we did this last semester in, or a few t sections ago, Doctrine of God. It defines relationship, right? Relationship, and even the fact that you and I are relational, is connected back to the Trinity. There was relationship before there was a world. There was already fellowship before there was anything created. Because in eternity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit were already fellowshipping. The extraordinary thing in this passage is that God's intention is for us to share, enjoy, see, rejoice in part of that relationship. Again, very, very careful to say, obviously, of course, not that we join the Trinity, but that we have kind of sitting on the sidelines the richness of joining in the purest form of love that has existed from all eternity, the relationship between the Father and the Son. Okay, now those are just some of the features I wanted to kind of pull out. Um, I'll show you two others here, and what they're going to do is emphasize Jesus' relationship to the Father or his equality with the Father. So let's look at two of those here. Uh, right at the beginning, Jesus, at the beginning of his prayer, he's saying things like this. We find the statement that he had or he shared in the Father's glory from the foundation of the world, thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Okay, so from the very, 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 very beginning, Jesus shared in the glory of the Father. And I also find this in verse 2. Uh, you have given him, it says power, that could be translated authority. You have given him authority over all flesh. He has the right to give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Okay, so I have two statements, I could look at others, that show me Jesus' equality with the Father. Now, here's a set of questions, though, and I'm asking these questions to kind of make us, wait, what, huh, what? Okay. Here's a set of questions, though, that in the passage are challenging because it sort of sounds like Jesus is separate from God, or Jesus is not God. Okay, I'll start with this one. Why does Jesus pray in the first place if he is God? When I pray, it's me, human, praying to God, right? Okay, that's, I pray so that I can fellowship with God, so that I can speak with God. So, okay. But why does Jesus need to pray? He is God. See, So, what, I mean, I've got here, and I have one other passage in Matthew where we see Jesus praying. Um, and there's one other statement, I think, earlier in John where Jesus says, like, a phrase or a sentence. Okay? But these are, these are really the two passages where we have Jesus, we have the, re the record of Jesus praying. There's lots of places where it says Jesus prayed, but where we have the record of what he said when he prayed. All right, here we see Jesus, Jesus praying. Why does Jesus pray, or should we say need to pray? Why does Jesus pray when he is God? What's going on here? Okay, there's more. Um, look at carefully verse 3. And I'm not just saying this in the hypothetical, by the way. I've had Jehovah's Witnesses, they like to go to this passage. This is one of the passages that they will be glad to go to. John 17, 3. 
This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. All right, so the logic or the way that they'll bring us to this passage is they'll say something like, well, um, who is the true God? And it says, there's only one true God. So there, the only true God, Jesus is speaking to him, separate from the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So you can't say, they're going to argue, you can't say that Jesus Christ is the true God. He can't be the true God because he's separate from the true God. He was sent by the true God. So there's the only true God, separate Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It's not the same thing, goes the argument. And if I keep on going down the passage, I see um, things like here, it's, well, it's on the screen already, verse 2, as thou hast given him authority over all flesh. Or a little further down, verse 7, uh, all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Or I'll say these in other words. Everything that the Father has given Jesus comes from the Father. So everything Jesus has in terms of authority, his words, all of this comes from the Father. And again, the argument would go, okay, so Jesus cannot be fully God or equivalent to the Father because all of this glory, authority, power, everything, all of that came from the Father, not of himself, not just of his own right. Um, how about verse 5, just backing up a little bit. I read this earlier, and I read this in relation to the making the point that um, Jesus had the same glory as the Father. But now notice verse 5, O Father, glorify thee, thou me, with thine own self. So Jesus asks the Father to give him glory, which would imply on some level, um, what? I have to, I'm going to be really careful with my language here. Anyway, to ask the Father to glorify him is asking for a change or for something to happen to him. Right? So does that mean Jesus needed glory? Jesus was less than glorious. And if you keep on reading down through the chapter, maybe a last point to say, you see constantly in here an idea like Jesus obeying the Father, Jesus doing what the Father gave him to do, Jesus receiving the Father's words, and then turning and proclaiming those words. They're not his own words. That, earlier in John, we see that as well. These are not his own words. They are the Father's words that he's communicating. Okay, so when you put all of that together, um, Jehovah's Witnesses and other, it's called Arians, people that deny the deity of Christ, are very glad to go to passages like this as a way of arguing that Jesus is not, cannot be, fully God. Because look at all of these statements. So how do we answer some of these questions? What, what I've done to you here is I've taken one of the deepest, thickest, a very complex passage, and we just jumped into it. And it, we're, we're looking around in all of the riches of this passage. What, what is, oh, wow. This is complex. This is thick. Right. And I do that in order to kind of introduce some of the questions for this course, where we're going for, for the next four Saturdays. Our time spent here will be on two topics. And the topic one is the Father. And the other topic is Christ. And we're going to talk about some of these exact issues. We're going to spend a good amount of time looking at some of the passages that say things like Jesus received authority from the Father or Jesus received glory from the Father. We're going to spend time trying to answer some of these questions. And we're going to try to answer the questions not just... Um, here, I'll give you a language that I hear sometimes. Sometimes people will say, can you disprove that passage, right? Because, uh, you know, Jehovah's Witness comes to them and he brings them John 17, 3. Okay, and so, look, Jesus Christ is not God. So can you disprove that passage? We're not going to disprove any passages in our time together. We don't believe in disproving passages. We believe in disproving bad interpretations of passages. I'll do that. I'm glad to disprove a bad argument based on a passage, but I don't disprove passages. And I don't even look at a verse and say, well, that's awkward. Let's read to the next verse. We want to believe that every single verse is precious, right? 
it's there for a reason. It, there, there are no bad verses. There are no verses that we don't like. We like all the verses. Right? So we're going to try to make an effort, as well as we read, not just to deal with passages, but understand passages. Right? Why are these statements here? They're not accidents. And as we work through that, then ultimately, what we're really praying, hoping for, and driving towards, we want to finish this time together, and we want Jesus Christ to be exalted in our hearts. Right? We want to get done and just be in awe at the glory of the Father, the glory of Jesus Christ, his Son, as a result of that, the glory of our salvation that we have in him. See, the whole point of our studying this together is for us just to be in awe at the richness of our Savior and the beauty of our God. Actually, the kind of theme that I have for this, this section that we'll have together, I want to convince you that Jesus Christ is the theme and the center of theology. I want to convince you that Jesus Christ is the theme and the center of theology. Now, I, I want to be very careful by saying something is the theme or the center. I don't want to say that other things are not important. So we could talk about the nature of God, the Trinity, salvation. I mean, it, right? Clearly, these are really rich, critical, beautiful concepts and components of theology. Um, my idea, though, of Jesus as the center is that these are, this is the part that everything else most naturally connects to. And as we study theology, we ought to see Jesus as the center, because I believe together with that, Jesus is the center of the Bible. Jesus is the center of Scripture. Since he's the center of Scripture, he should also be the center of my theology. The two go together. And that's our goal. That's our plan for this course. So before I show you some of the specific um, pieces, the nuts and bolts and you know, the things that we're going to hammer together in order to try to build the class together. Um, I want to start with a word of prayer. And we're going to ask the Lord to help us because we, we are very much desperate right now for his help. We need his leading right now to, what do you say, um, to, to counteract the brokenness that is in my heart, right? Uh, just to, to understand the way this works my heart, uh, I've done this before with my students with a magnet. Excuse me, I think I have one right here. I found it. Uh, this is a magnet. Each one of these ends are, are these are both magnets, okay? So you can kind of see how they, I'll hold them together and they snap together, right? That's a magnet. Okay, it's a pretty strong magnet. But you know how this works, right? If I flip it around, and I, well, I need to do it opposites. If I flip it around and I try to push the pieces together, that don't match. They don't want to, right? They're gonna flip themselves so that they will match because these two sides don't go together, right? And so they're pushing against me, right? I mean, I, I'm even trying. I'm trying to push it together. It doesn't want to. The magnet is really strong. It doesn't want to connect. It wants to slide off on the side, right? Okay, that in some ways is my heart with the truth. <laughs> now, by God's grace and by his spirit, um, what we're hoping for and praying for, by his grace, it is possible for my heart to be more like this side of the magnet that wants the truth. And by his grace and his spirit, yes. But my natural human heart is like the backwards magnet, and it, it's, it refuses truth. And so the harder you press with the word of God, no, this is the truth. My, my heart is resisting because my heart doesn't want to <laughs> accept that truth. All right. And what we're begging for and what we're desperate for is for God to change my heart so that it is possible. Right? That's a miracle. Human hearts don't do this. Here's natural human hearts. That's the way my heart works, right? It resists. This is the miracle of grace that my heart would accept the truth. And that's what we've got to pray. We've got to beg God to help us do that. We've got to beg him for grace so that our hearts will truly be ready to adhere to the truth. So let's do that. Let's open in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the richness of the truths that we've just read. We thank you that there is 
a God in heaven that has created all things, that before there was a world, before there was us, before there was anything, eternally, from all eternity past, you are God. You have always been. And in the richness of that, we thank you. You have always been, and you have always been in relationship. You, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, from all eternity in fellowship. So that it is not just your existence that is eternal, but it is relationship and fellowship that is eternal. We do thank you that you created, you chose to create a world, that you chose to create us. And we thank you that you made it good. We thank you that even when our sin broke it, and in all the horror of sin that has come ever since, we thank you that you did not give up on us. We thank you that you gave us life, cleansing, and forgiveness. We thank you that Jesus Christ is that life. We thank you that the word took flesh. We thank you that he dwelt among us. We thank you that in his life we see light, we see holiness, we see truth. We thank you for every event of his life and the rich truths we see in every one of those events in his birth, and his baptism, and his transfiguration, and his miracles, in his death, and his resurrection, and his ascension, in everything that he did, we see that Jesus Christ was the light and the life we desperately need. We thank you that because of his suffering, and his death, and his resurrection, we can have light and life. Thank you that we are part of the group in John 17, those who will believe in him through the word of the apostles. That we have received your word, we have received the New Testament, we have received the gospel, we have heard the good news about Jesus, and because of that our lives have been transformed. And that because of that then we rejoice and we love to study your word. We pray that during the next four weeks you would sanctify us through your truth. We pray that we would grow in our love and our appreciation of eternal life. Eternal life which is to know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And we pray that through the process of our being sanctified and our growing to better appreciate and love our eternal life, that you would help us that we would be made one, that our hearts would be drawn towards one another, our hearts would be drawn towards you. That you would increase our love for you through this time. We are desperate that during the four, next four weeks we would not just learn information, but that through these four weeks we would be changed. We pray that specific things, specific things in our life, tangible things in our lives would be different four weeks from now because of the truths that we've talked about together. That you would use our time here to change us in our hatred of sin and our love for you and our appreciation of your word so that one, one month from now we would be closer to you than we are today because of the truth that we have discussed together. And we're confident, we confess, that if this time spent together each week is truly focused on your word, not just ideas, not just philosophy, and not just notions that we have in our heads, but that if our time over these four weeks is focused on your words, your truth, we're confident and we confess, we believe with all our hearts, you will change us. Your word will not return to you void. So we're asking that you would guard us from the brokenness of our thinking, and that you would cement us instead to the truth of your words and control our thinking with that. And we ask this all in your son's name. Amen. Okay. Uh, I want to look at a couple of things with you, just more like 
in the administrative category of thinking about the course here together. So first thing I will show you here, I'm gonna send you a link in the chat. And um, if you're not familiar with Zoom already, no worries, it's really, really easy to pick some of this up. There's a button down below that says chat. Uh, that's a great place for you to be able to interact with other people, answer questions, or what I just sent you. I just sent you a link, and that link is to all of the materials for the course. So that's a Dropbox link. That folder, if I add things into that folder or I make changes in that folder at any point, uh, the things I add in there, you'll be able to access. So I would hang on to that link. It's not just a, well, download it one time and then forget about it kind of link. It's a thing that's there for you to come back to because I will be adding other information to it. Um, if you like this better, here's another form of the same link. It's maybe a little bit, little bit more manageable or a little bit easier to remember. It's just a, it's a, just a shortcut that goes to the same link. So it's exactly, exactly the same. Um, here you go. And so it's bit.ly slash CEA, Continue Education for All, Father. These are uh, case sensitive. So make sure you get the case right. CEA is caps, father is not caps. And then that's an L-Y, bit.ly. So if that's an easier link, it's the, it's the same thing. It goes to the same place, but you can use that as a link as well. Okay, now if you go to the Dropbox folder, uh, what are you gonna see there? And um, when you get there, you'll see right now, pretty simple, but I'll, I'll be adding a lot more even actually later on today. Uh, but one thing you're going to see is the full syllabus. And in case it saves you a step, I'm just gonna inundate you with links here. Uh, if it saves you a step, here's the direct link to the syllabus, which is the document that we're using for the course. Okay, so that will be all of the notes, that's the schedule, the, the different assignments, the questions that you can answer, that's just everything. Um, let's look at that. Let's take a second and I'll open that up for us here. We can take a little look at what we have in that document because that's going to be kind of your core document as we keep on going here. Okay. So here, first thing you've got is um, just a schedule, just a layout of what we're looking at for the class. And you'll see on here a bad word. The bad word is uh, homework. Um, let me just wait here. So are you seeing, um, not seeing any of the links? Oh, well, I'm sorry. Let me try that again. Give me a second. I don't know. Um, hmm. Okay, let's try this again. Let's see this. No? Ah, I found it. I fixed my error. Problem solved. I'm 98% sure of it. So try it again. Here is the original link that I was going to send you. And um, this will be for that entire Dropbox folder. There we go. I am sure you saw it that time. Yes? Good. I see that head nodded. Uh, here's the shorter form of that link if that's easier to hang on to. Sorry about the trouble there getting all of that worked out. But that's the shorter form if that's a little easier to manage. Okay. Whew. Got that worked out. All right. Um, so go back here and let's resume our share. This is the schedule that I was talking about. And let me know if you aren't seeing things. Thank you, John, for letting me know that. Um, I have different pieces of information here. I have my, I have my cell phone number there. Uh, I have the playlist here for YouTube. And that's a YouTube, that's a playlist that actually is going, I'm going to put up other things that are kind of related. Like I put a video in there from Iglesia Ni Cristo that I thought was really interesting, just to show you how different our viewpoint is. Okay. So things like that, just helpful resources that you can look at. And then here's that Dropbox link. So if you want to go and check out the Dropbox, you want to look at any of those materials, that's there. Um, and then finally, here's a schedule. Okay. And we have four weeks. Here's today. Uh, lecture topic, we're going to talk about the Father. We're going to give an introduction to the doctrine of Christ. And then we'll talk about homework uh, next week for next week. 
I would just ask you to read the next chapter and we'll continue on like that, okay? So the idea is before you come back next week, if you read the chapter on the Father, I think it's 11 pages. Um, so it's, it's a reading. I mean, it's, there, there's some pages there, but break it down and you're looking at maybe, um, I don't know, a page, a page and a half a day. I mean, it's not too bad. It's pretty doable. And you have some study questions in there as well, and then a project that I'll talk about. Okay, um, I'm going to keep on moving, then I'll come back and show you some of what this looks like. But let's do this now, because I referred to chapter, study questions, project, what's all of that about? Well, let's scroll down a little bit. Um, here are study questions for the chapter, and my idea here was, as you read through the chapter, you might be a little overwhelmed. What do I, wait, what do I focus on? What do I look at? What's the big thing to turn my attention towards? Um, and the answer as you look through these study questions is I want you to follow each one of these questions on the chapter. Okay, so question number one, father implies relationship with someone else. What are the four categories? Well, the answer to that is in your chapter. Okay, it's right in there. You just kind of work through, look through the text of the chapter, you'll find the answer to that. Each one of these questions are in there. I don't, I don't ask you, um, what do you say? I don't ask you like, you know, look for these words in the chapter because I'm looking for concepts. So it's not just like, okay, the answer is the third sentence down, fourth word in. It's, it's not like a fill in the blank sort of thing. You're gonna have to think through the concepts of it, but the information's all in the chapter. It's all there, right? And the same thing with the following chapters, the person of Christ, the life of Christ. These are, I'm just trying to guide your reading. So you kind of know where to go in the chapter as you read along, okay? Um, so those are the study questions. My recommendation would be maybe if you write, let's say, three to five sentences, what, what I recommended to my students before, if they got a note card, and on the note card or an index card, then they just write the answer to each one of these questions. They write like a little short three to five sentence answer for each question. When you get done, you have a stack of index cards, and each one of those index cards is one of these questions. So now you can use these as flashcards, right? You have your index card, it has the question, you look at the question, wait, okay, what did I learn about that? Flip it over, there's the information you wrote, your, your three to five sentence essay, right? And you can go to the next one, flip it over, did I get that, right? So it gives you a way to study. And I, that would be my, my, you know, my personal, like the ultimate preference I would have, my recommendation is get a pack of index cards and just write the question on one side and on the other side write three to five sentences summarizing that question. Okay, because these questions right here, these are what I use for the test. So when you think about the final exam, how am I gonna write the final exam? The way I'm gonna write the final exam is I'll go in here and I'll look at Father and I'll choose you know a couple of questions out of the Doctrine of the Father and I'll scroll down and the person of Christ, and I'll choose a couple of questions, person of Christ, and the life of Christ, and that's the test, literally. Okay? I might have one or two questions that are not included among these, maybe something that we discussed here. But basically, if you can give a solid, thorough answer to the questions in that list, you're ready for the test. I mean, that is the test. I, I, I go through and I pull out those questions, and that becomes the test. So I've given you the test. <laughs> I've given you the test in forms of in the form of a list of questions and if you're prepared for those that's it um on the test I am NOT asking for like multiple choice or true false I I, I, I I won't have any of those everything will be essay um, but essay just means like those questions that you have there if you can give me three to five sentences with scriptural information Right? That's a, a thing that's really big for me. I want you to give me biblical information support. Not just some ideas, but biblical. The, when I see verses, and it may not be references, but it could even be something like, okay, John 17, 3. Jesus had the glory of the Father from before the foundation of the world. You could say, in John 17, Jesus said he had the glory of the Father from before the foundation of the world. Great, that counts. That's a verse. Right. So I, I don't feel like uh, I expect you to memorize tons and tons of numbers. Numbers, nobody ever got saved from memorizing numbers, right? But I want you to know the, the statements. I want you to know the texts. 
fantasy. So if you can tell me this text says that, even a paraphrase, it's fine, doesn't need to be word for word, a paraphrase of a phrase, or in this place we read that, we learn that. That's the kind of thing that I look at a text, I go, oh, that's gold. Because that's, that's the essence of doing theology. The essence of doing theology is understanding God's words, right? Knowing how to understand God's words. Okay, I hope that makes some sense. Um, if there are any questions, you can let me know. I did have you do some, uh, some project, or I did include some projects in here. Um, and the projects just look like this. For instance, the first, who is the angel of the Lord? And I am asking you to read through these uh, verses right here. Now, I'll put it in the Dropbox during the break. I haven't put it in yet. But I have this in a form that's already printed for you. So, I mean, if you're into Bible software or something, you can, if you can copy this out. You can drop this into your Bible software. Boom, you can read it that way. Or I created a PDF for you in, um, I think, three translations. I think I have King James, ESV, and Ang Biblia. Okay? So... Open up one of those PDFs, read through these verses in those passages. It's already in one document for you, so you can just click right down through. It's really easy. And then what we're asking is these questions, uh, or what we are asking, based on these passages, can this be just another angel? Do you notice any patterns for how to know when Scripture is referring to the unique angel of the Lord? And after you do that now, what, after you've done that work, you can read the notes and there are some ideas in the notes about who is the angel of the Lord. And then you just summarize your findings in a one-page right, one page write-up of some of the things you found. My, my idea with these projects, I'm not, I'm not looking for you to, you know, writing a formal paper and that kind of thing. No, I'm, I'm, trying, to give you, um, I'm trying to give you a fun and helpful Bible study. So basically, I'm handing you a Bible study. Try this out. Or I'm thinking of the Bible study here like a tour guide, right? A tour guide takes you through, hey, you know, look at that. Okay, you've got to notice, notice over there. I'm trying to be a tour guide for you on a specific doctrine of the Bible. You know, look at this. Make sure you notice that. Check that out. There's something going on. Oh, you need to see. All right. That's the kind of notion I'm, I'm hoping to go for here. So if you'll do that... My prayer is this should be, I pray, a really devotional thing. I, I, I'm not really trying to drive you towards academic theology here. Um, I'm trying to drive you towards devotional theology, devotionally understanding the richness of this truth. And if you do that project, you could do it in your devotions. I think, I pray, you'll really enjoy it. I think you'll get a blessing from it. Okay, that was project number one. There are two other projects in here. Uh, or excuse me, just one other, defending the deity of Christ. And here, my concept goes, you are going to meet people who are going to attack the deity of Christ in the process of witnessing. People are going to come, they're going to bring up these passages like John 17, 3. Um, and so I meet you some passages that they like to bring up. These are some of the key passages that Jehovah's Witnesses and others like to use to try to deny the deity of Jesus. And then I also gave you a way to pull together some information, some proofs for his deity. I'll just say, this study right here, this, again, is really not just an academic exercise. I think every believer ought to have some of this information. Every believer ought to have some passages that are bedrock for you, for your understanding that Jesus is fully God. You realize your eternity rests on the deity of Jesus. Right. So, I mean, this is, this is really important, okay? It's really important that you know that Jesus is God and why. Really important. And it will just help you as a believer, and it will help you in witnessing. It's going to help you in ministry. This is going to come up. People are going to ask you. You are going to talk to people who attack you on this doctrine. You need to have some answers. Okay? Um, Jehovah's Witnesses, particularly target evangelicals and Baptists because many within those circles don't know why they believe in the deity of Christ. And it's really easy for them to convert somebody out of those circles because people just don't know. Okay? You don't be that guy. Make sure you're not that guy. 
and make sure the people under your care, the people you have influence with, the people that you talk to in the future are not going to be that person, right? Because you have, you've done some work and you understand some of these passages. You know why you believe that Jesus Christ is fully God. <laughs> really, you want to know that. So that's my idea. Those are, pos are projects that are, I'm, I'm giving them to you as, uh, basically as Bible studies, things that you can spend time um, and I pray learn more about God's word from those. Okay, let me say this as far as just the, this is the academic administrative side of the course goes. Um, if you are a BJMBC student or you anticipate that you're going to be a BJMBC program student, meaning you would pursue like a, a year degree or a two year degree or something like that. So you would in the future like to graduate from BJMBC. The requirement would be you go ahead and fill out the full, the full requirements that we have here. So fill out, I gave you, I think on the projects, uh, one page for the angel of the Lord, two pages for the deity of Christ. So that's the requirement I'm asking from you. Okay? And the reason I say that, that's the exact, uh, I think uh, John, Jennifer, you know this, that's the exact requirement I gave them last semester. Okay, so exactly. So th this class that we're doing here, I'm not I'm not lowering it down or watering it down any. It's just the same thing that we do in our normal classes. Okay. Now, if someone is coming in as uh, the category, like a lay person or a person you're taking this course because, well, I'd like to work, pursue towards a certificate or something like that, but not as a full-time program BJ and BC student. The requirements will be lesser for you. And basically, in order to keep this simple, uh, you can take these requirements and just cut them in half. So where it says a full page, if you write a half page, where it says defending the deity of Christ instead of two pages, if you want to make that one page, that's fine. And we are making that adjustment because the purpose of CEA for a person pursuing like a certificate, there's a different purpose there. So this is something Dr. K and I have discussed together just as a way of, of making a clear divide there. Okay? And the purpose of CEA is so that anyone is able to study and through this kind of method. Okay, so a little bit of a distinction there. If you're planning to use this as a credit towards a program degree, you're going to take a degree at BJMBC, then go ahead and fulfill the full requirements. Otherwise, just if you take about half of what I've given you here, give for those of you that are taking it that way, give a, a sentence or two per question, that's sufficient. Okay, if you have questions, you can message me or we can correspond during the break. Happy to talk about that further. And then what I'm going to do here last is just show you the remainder of the syllabus so you see where this goes. This is the entire section we're talking about. Actually, within the section is the spirit. We won't talk about the spirit during this section. Uh, that'll be in a future section. But we're talking about the Father and the Son. And if you look at the chapters after here, chapter 14, the Eternal Father. Chapter 15 is going to be on the life of Christ. Here I can find it. I'll show you what that looks like. Chapter, or excuse me, the person of Christ. So the person of Christ, who is he? Fully God, fully man. How we understand some of those things. And then the final chapter we talk about is the life of Christ. And under the life of Christ, we go through some of the events of his life, his birth, his transfiguration, baptism, death, resurrection, what some of these things mean. Okay, so that's your syllabus. That's the, the document that we'll be working through there. Any questions on any of that? Um, you can drop that in the chat if you have questions. And I will just go back up to the top again to look at that in terms of the schedule, and then we'll take a break. So please, questions if you have them, happy to hear there. Uh, here, the schedule, just so we kind of get that big picture again. Here's what we will talk about today for next week. So when you come back next Saturday, I would have asked you to read the first chapter, the chapter on the Father, and you answer these study questions, which would be these right here. So questions one to seven, you've worked through now from the chapter and you've just gotten an answer to those questions. And then the project here, the project of the angel of the Lord, that's this project uh, right here, who is the angel of the Lord. Okay, so when you come in next week, you do that. Um, I don't know, I'm gonna guess you probably could get this done maybe four to five hours. And my recommendation, I, I believe in this very strongly. I'm, this is, this is my, my life. This is every day I do this. I believe very strongly in breaking things up into little pieces 
And if you read a little bit at a time, that adds up and it becomes a lot. So I have a book right here that I'm reading um, and it's a big thick, it's, it's thick, it's not, it's not anything that, you, I can't read it fast. It, you have to read it really slowly. Well, yesterday I did my reading in here and I did, I'm just gonna count, I think I did five pages. Okay. But I did five pages in this book, I did five pages in this book. Um, you know, I just do a little bit. And if I break it out over time, that accumulates and that's a lot. A little bit over and over every day is a lot. Okay? So just some advice or a recommendation. How about this? How about each day next week, you just read two passages, or excuse me, two pages, and you answer one or two questions. And I mean, that's really, really doable, right? Maybe 20, 30 minutes. Read two pages, answer one or two questions, but do it every day. And then on the Angel of the Lord project, how about this? How about consider making that your devotions next week? I mean, if you already have something that you're doing, a Bible reading plan or something, great. Don't let me mess that up. But if you don't already have something, you know, really, really segmented that's already set out, scheduled out, that could be your devotions next week. So if you did your devotions from the Angel of the Lord passages, you get to the end of the week, you're done. It's a Bible study. It's not just academic. You're studying the Bible, right? It's a great thing, I think, a great devotional study. So if you do it that way, this is not a big homework load. Maybe 20 to 30 minutes a day, along with your devotions, you're done. Right? And not everyone here was planning, I know, to do um, credit. A lot of you were planning to do audit. That's great. I'm glad for you to do audit. I, th I kind of think even if you're audit, you'll get more out of the course if you're able to do some of these projects. Um, if you're able to read the notes, you're going to learn more, I promise, because we're in the class, we're going to discuss those a lot. Okay, so the more you're able to do, the more you'll benefit. And I, I hope you'll consider, even if you're audit, uh, I've taken courses audit before, and my philosophy, when I take as audit, I just do it as if I'm part of the class. Because otherwise, well, I'll tell you what happens, otherwise I'm just sitting there, I'm not even understanding what they're talking about, because they did all the homework, I didn't, I didn't read the notes. I'm just sitting there and I'm kind of wasting. Okay, so I benefit a lot more if I go ahead and do the, the work together with the class. And I, I hope you'll consider that even if you're audit status. Okay, if there are no questions, I'll give us a break. So last chance for questions. All right, um, well, let's take a break here. I've got 924, so we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back at 934. 924 to 934, and then we'll pick up then. That work? All right, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thanks. Talk to you in a bit. Let's do this for starters. We've got several things we're going to work on here, but the biggest thing we're, uh, the core, the topic we're discussing is the Father. And before we look at some of the details or I start asking you some questions about that, um, let's start by just looking at our chapter and making sure we understand what we have in the chapter or how the chapter itself is arranged. So this is that document, our syllabus document that we're using. Um, I am going to start out by summarizing the biblical information. So just talking about where I see the discussion of the Father. And when I do that, I'm going to see these patterns. The Old Testament, Israel. A little further, I'm going to see the Father and the Son, and this is the New Testament now. And then um, a third component of that is how we relate to the concept of a father. Okay. So basically the flow of thought goes, the father in relationship to Israel, the father in relationship to Jesus, the father in relationship to us, his children. Okay, that kind of progression. Um, that's the first section and we summarize it. The second section, I'm asking what does father mean? Like, so, all right, you've heard that, just am on. Okay, God the Father, what does that mean? Like, why that, why that language? Why that way of saying it, right? So what is the concept of a, the Father? Why is he called the Father? What does it mean that he's called the Father? And underneath that, we end up with three components or three ideas. He is the source of all. There's a relationship kind of idea, and there's also a chastening idea. Right? 
actually what I'm doing in this chart is I'm combining those three ideas of the meaning with the four ideas over here of the, the ones he relates to. God relates to the creation as Father, Israel, Jesus Christ, and believers. Okay? But he does that on these, so all of them actually are lining up here. Okay, um, here is basically a, a struggle with a, a difficulty. The Father is greater than all. Have you ever read that phrase? And um, maybe it bothers you a little bit. Jesus even says the Father is greater than I. So how can the Father be greater than Jesus if Jesus is fully God? And so what we're going to get in here is some discussion of the Father and the Son being equal in glory. And what does that mean? Okay, and we explain a little bit about, about some of that, what it means that Jesus was uh, submitted to the Father. Another question is, is the Father male or is God male? Uh, maybe that would be better, that heading would be better, is God male, just like that. Um, but the point of it is, father, it's not mother, right? I mean, so father has in it, built into the concept of father, there's a maleness idea, right? And so how do I understand some of that? And the last section we have here, trying to understand which passages refer to the father. By which I just mean, when you read through the Bible, sometimes you read God, Okay, and the question goes, when I read God or Lord, L-O-R-D, is that the Father? Is that possibly Jesus? Is that the entire Trinity? What does that refer to? Okay. And that's going to finish out our chapter. Okay, that's just an attempt to give you a little overview of the chapter. To those of you that were in the class last semester, those last two sections are new. Uh, one of those, actually, you did a little project on. Um, so I, I went ahead and wrote up a section and just, I was trying to digest some of the ideas also. So anyway, those last two sections you've not read just because they've been written since we met. Okay, um, as far as that goes then, let's do our best to talk about some of these ideas. And I'm, I'm going to start out with one question that's interesting to me, something that's worth uh, our thinking through. I'm kind of curious, why don't we really, why don't we really study the doctrine of God the Father? Um, if I look at a lot of seminary textbooks or a lot of systematic theology textbooks, there will be a doctrine of God, theology proper, they're going to call it. There will be a doctrine of God. There will be a chapter on Christology or the doctrine of Christ. There will be a chapter on the Spirit. Um, but, I mean, they'll have maybe a heading or something that talks about the Father, but it's kind of interesting to me. There's not, there, and even just that, there, we call it Christology, for the doctrine of Christ. We call it pneumatology for the doctrine of the Spirit. Um, we don't really have a word for the doctrine of the Father. You could call it patrology, but generally patrology means studying the church fathers. So anyway, we don't even have a word that we really use, and we don't really tend to, um, we don't really tend to give ourselves a chapter on it, which is a little bit concerning, or it's at least something maybe we could do better on because of this. If you actually start looking through, and you start looking for the word Father, uh, referring, of course, to God the Father, then you're going to find it all over the place across the Bible. It's a really, really big deal. And what I'll do is I'll show you here, Just to, I'm just trying to convince you that it's a really big deal, that it's everywhere. Um, what I did here, this is just a search on the word father, actually, technically what I did, I searched for capital father, because I didn't want to get, you know, uh, so-and-so was the father of, <laughs> right, in all the genealogies. So I searched for capital, capital father, and if I just start scanning through, um, I'm going to have 231 places where the Bible refers to the father, capital, which in the English system means it's it's uh, a reference to God. Okay, I'm halfway through, and I just scrolled. I mean, I'm scrolling fast, right? I'm just finishing the book of John. Okay, we just crossed into over to Acts and Romans. There, finally, we're getting to almost, wait for, okay. That was a lot of passages. 231 passages that use the word Father, uh, capital letter, referring to God. And actually, if you do this across both Testaments, and there's some differences uh, depending on how you do the search and things like that. But pretty fair to say you probably get 290 times altogether. 
around 290, almost 300 times, that it will specifically say the Father, referring to God the Father. Okay, well, that's a big deal. It's a huge concept. Um, how about this is just a thing that's kind of, hmm. We talk about God the Father, and we even talk about the Son, Jesus Christ the Son. Do we know why the Bible chose to use that word? See, so let's say you're having a conversation with uh, Jehovah's Witness. I, I've had right down there at the end of the sidewalk, <laughs> at my front gate. Um, I stood out there, and my son Jeremy was with me, and, the, and a Jehovah's Witness said to me, well is this your son? And I said, yes. And they said, so now if he's your son, he's not you, right? So father, son, that means they're separate. They're not the same. So you can't look at your son and say, that's you. So how can you look at God and say that Jesus Christ is also God? He's separate, right? You and your son are separate and God and Jesus are separate. They're, you can't say they're the same. Okay. Um, you know, I can talk about that argument and why it doesn't work later on. But a question to ask here is, all right, what does the Bible mean by son and father? Why did it use that language? See, so I have a son, I am a father. Why did the Bible, he, he could have chosen any set of different ideas or comparisons. Why did he choose those words? Why those ideas? And what do they mean? Jesus Christ is the son of God. Very, very important doctrine. Amen. Support it. What does it mean? Oh, well, I don't know about that. Then what are we supporting anyway? <laughs> right? I mean, if we, if we cherish the doctrine, if we love the doctrine, if we believe in the doctrine deeply, then the greatest honor we could do to the doctrine is to understand it, <laughs> to know what it means, right? <laughs> All right. So you can't defend something you don't understand. All right? We ought to understand it. And don't worry. If you sit here and, yeah, I don't know what the son is or I don't know what the father is, no problem. That's why we're here. We're going to do this together. And, and it's, it's not exactly the easiest concept to get right away. So we're going to study it carefully together. We'll get it. We'll talk about it together. Okay. That's what we're wanting to do here. Um, how about this? I'll just show you a couple of passages that are challenges that I also want to talk about here together as we have the opportunity during this time. How about uh, a couple of passages like this here? Jesus says, and that's visually really hard to process quickly there. So let me see if I can move this down. And we'll take out the, lead, the red letter so that you can see it a little better. better. There we go. Uh, verse 26. He says, As the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And the Father is also given authority to execute justice. Because judgment also, because he is, or the Son has been given authority because he is the Son of Man. Okay, so what that sounds like to me, is it saying that Jesus has received his life from the Father? Jesus received his life. What do you think? I mean, read it. As the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Okay. I mean, that's basically what the verse says. Jesus received life from the Father. So if that's true, how can Jesus be God? I'm not denying the deity of Jesus. I believe deeply and strongly in the deity of Jesus. I just read a verse and I asked a question about the verse. That's what we're doing. And there is a way to understand the verse correctly. And we will talk about that. Okay. But you want to have an answer there. You want to know what's going on in that verse, right? Okay. So what does that mean? It sounds like the father gave life to the son, meaning, um, like the son came into existence by the father's will or something like that. Is that what it said? Or here's another passage that's a little challenging like that. It pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell. So by the father's work, Jesus Christ had all of this fullness. Right? So based on the father's working in him, something like that. Or even actually earlier in the passage, there's another um there's another struggle like that. Here it is. Uh, the firstborn, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So it sounds like he's the first creation. Okay, actually in Revelation there's something like that. The beginning of God's creation. The firstborn of God's creation. Okay, so does that mean that Jesus was created? 
the Son was created instead of being fully God, instead of being the creator. Here's John 10, 29, another passage that works like this and can be a little confusing unless we work through it. My Father, which, is, which gave them me, is greater than all. No one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So the Father is greater than all, is he greater than the Son? 1 Corinthians 8, 6, To us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Okay, so there's one, again, another passage that a Jehovah's Witness will go to. There is one God, the Father is that God, and it sounds like separately, one Lord Jesus Christ. So the Father and Jesus, separate. So how do I understand some of these passages? They're there. All I'm reading is Bible. Right? They're there, and we ought to understand them because they are part of God's words that we're supposed to understand. Okay, um, I, by doing that, I'm trying to create a little, some questions, some interests, some, wow, wait, how do we understand that? So let's talk about a couple of things here bef as we get into understanding this doctrine or understanding what's going on here. And I'll start with this. We need to recover a little bit of content. I can't afford to spend a huge amount of time here. But we need to recover a little bit of content understanding the doctrine of the Trinity. And that was something that we did in a previous class. We worked through some of this information already. So as I said, I can't, I can't afford to spend a lot of time. But what are, how about this? I like this. Uh, Bible doctrine students that have already been through some of this content what are the three foundations that we have for the doctrine of the Trinity? I'm going to put you guys on the spot. So I'm Jennifer, the two Johns. I'm looking through Elts here, my princess. Um, those of you that have taken the Bible doctrines class already, and we've looked through some of these, there are three foundations that we talked about that were kind of our core foundations for the doctrine of the Trinity. And you guys are on the spot. We're waiting for you to give us wisdom and help us enlighten our minds, open our understanding, so that we can understand these things. So, what would you say? Or anyone, actually. There are three foundations, three core concepts that you have to know, have to know, in order to understand the Trinity and what Scripture talks about it. All right, don't overwhelm me with chat messages here. I can't read them. Just kidding, nothing's come in yet. What do we have here? Who will give me something? Okay, to those of you who are just uh, admitted into the, into the room, I'm sorry for the delay there. Uh, we will also post everything on YouTube so you can catch up some of our earlier content. Where we're at right now is working to understand the doctrine of the Trinity. And that's in order to help us understand a little bit, a little, little bit better, a little bit more of what is going on the Father and the Son, what's happening there. Um, Okay, so I'm looking here. Someone commented here. Each member of the Trinity is fully God, and each member of the Trinity is distinct. Perfect. Okay, those are foundations that we talked about. Let me show you how that looked in some notes that we did talk about before in the past in a previous class. Here are the three statements. The three persons of God are each distinct. The three persons are each fully God, and God is one. The three persons of God are each distinct. The three persons are each fully God, and God is one. Okay? Now, I can support those with different passages. We're going to look at some of those in a second. Um, how about we'll just look at one or two just very representative passages that will give us some ideas that, that kind of represent some of that. So um, here are a couple of passages that refer to all three persons together in a group. 
and they look like this. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, here's another passage that fits into that. I'll put up Matthew 28. And uh, this is a passage that we're all very familiar with. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so three persons put together as one group. Uh, here's another that works like that, 2 Corinthians 13, 13 verse 14. Um, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Okay, all three persons put together as one group. Now, that actually tells me two different things at the same time, doesn't it? It tells me that the three persons belong together. In other words, you would never do something, how about this? Um, all right, I'm going to... Uh, Brother Lance, I'm going to use you as an example. Sorry, huh? Uh, so here's a here's here's three. Um, okay, uh, President Duterte, President Trump, and Lance Reyes. Okay, now that trio doesn't quite it doesn't quite go, does it? Because I named two presidents and one beloved member of the BJMBC family, but he's not a president. See, it doesn't fit. And it sounds weird to put them in a group like that, okay? Now, how about this? Would you ever want to say something like this, right? Uh, Almighty God and Michael the Archangel and Gabriel the Archangel and put them in a group of three. See, that doesn't work, does it? Okay. So you have these three stated together in parallel multiple times across Scripture. God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit. What? What's going on here? Okay. So that's a one foundation. The three persons are equal. They're fully God. And actually, you can look at a couple of passages, or a, a, a massive group of passages, that will support each one of the persons and their deity. I can't do that for the sake of time here. Um, but now pause for a second. Think about it again, though. I listed three. So one thing it taught me is that the three are parallel. They're each equal in glory. But listen to this. I listened, listed out the three. That tells me that they're also separate. They're not, and they can't be the same because they're separate persons. Okay? And so that was one of our other foundations, if you recall. When we were just looking a moment ago at the, the three foundations for the Trinity, one of them was the three persons are each distinct. They're not the same persons. And now we can support this with another group of passages. One of the most interesting on this count is the baptism of Jesus. And Matthew 3.16, Jesus, when he was baptized, came out of the waters. The heavens were open to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending and a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, so if I'm looking at that passage, what I have here is Jesus separately coming down towards Jesus is the Spirit, separately a voice, which is the Father, saying, this is my Son. I have three, one, two, three separate persons. They're all distinct. They're not the same. And I could look at other passages with you that are going to distinguish this kind of thing. Uh, here's one. I'll just look at this one, John 14, 26. And again, I have the same in one verse, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he, the Holy Ghost, will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said. So I've got within the verse several times the Holy Spirit, the Father, and Jesus separately. They're all the same. So we worked through some of that information before when we talked about the Trinity, and we ended up with a kind of a summary statement or a, a summary representation of it. I'm not super into using analogies for the Trinity. In fact, I, I just don't like using analogies for the Trinity. But this is a way of graphically stating the information. The biblical information is that the Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son. They're different. Each one is different. So the Son can speak to the Father. The Son can pray to the Father. The Father sent the Son. 
The Father and the Son sent the Spirit. Okay, they're distinct. They're different. These three persons are not the same as each other. They are distinct. But the Son is God. The Spirit is God. The Father is God. Okay, and I'm not saying with this diagram that the Trinity is like a triangle. I'm not trying to do any kind of analogy. It's just a way of keeping track of the information so you can kind of see it in a form that you can see the way they all go. Okay? The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, but all of them are God. The three persons are God. Okay? They're fully God, even though they are not the same as the other persons. Okay, that's a kind of a quick whew over the Trinity. And we can support each one of those points using lots of biblical information that, that represents or supports that. Any questions there before I keep on going? Talking about just an overview or a, kind of a big picture thinking about the Trinity. What is the Trinity? What does that mean? Okay, so if I'm working through that information now, Yes, someone was commenting here, three persons but one God. That's it. All right. If I'm then thinking through there, okay, good. How, how can uh, someone not go to the idea of having three gods? Right. Which is the third foundation that we talked about. There is one God, not three gods. All right. So I have biblical informations for all three. There is one God, not three gods. The Father, the Son, the Spirit, they are not the same but each one of them is God. I put those three pieces of information. I have the Trinity. That's why we believe in the Trinity. Okay, if I'm starting to work from that information now, then I need to start thinking about who is the Father? What does this mean? What is the concept of the Father? And here I'm going to go to your notes. I'm just going to work our way down through the notes, try to understand some of the concepts or highlight some of the concepts that I want you to get from that. If I start looking through the concept of the Father. The first thing I get repeatedly a bunch of times in Scripture is the, re the concept of the Father in relationship to Israel. Okay, so here's a pattern. God sends a message to Pharaoh and he says, Israel is my firstborn son. You are sons of the living God. You are sons of the Lord your God. And the concept then is God has relationship with Israel. It's a loving relationship kind of song concept, okay? So we have, like, here you can put in, like, a Father's Day sort of idea, right? Father's Day, it's, you know, fathers loving their children, children loving their fathers. Okay, it's this warm, taking care of someone sort of concept, right? So your father cares for you sort of notion. Okay, but I'll keep on going because you discover quickly Israel is God's son. It's a relationship thing. But Israel also fails. They turned from the rock that bore you. They forgot the God who gave them birth. And so now Israel is going to be punished for their failure. This takes us into an interesting direction. We start reading passages like this. Um, a much future, richer future hope that David's son will be God's son. And that there is a coming son, the Messiah. And we're starting to read things in, in the Old Testament that are starting, to, I guess, kind of to be confusing. Things like this. The Messiah will cry out, you are my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. Or Psalm 2 speaking, and the sun reigning over the entire world. So even in the Old Testament, I'm already starting to form up, to form up some ideas. God is the father to Israel. God is the father to the Messiah. What's going on here? How do these things fit together? I'll show you one passage that does this. Let's look at Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is going to give us a, a strong picture of some of this Old Testament concept of the Father. Why do the heathen rage? The key people imagine a vain thing. They set themselves against the Lord. Now, this word, and against his Messiah, the word anointed is Messiah. They set themselves against Yahweh and against his Messiah, and they're going to attack him. But the Lord has decreed, you, here is the decree, you are my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I will give you the heathen for thine inheritance. So he will reign over all, he will be the king over all. Be wise therefore, O king, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, 
lest he be angry and you perish from the way. Blessed are all they that put, put their trust in him. Okay, so the question when you read the psalm, who is this son? I have it here. I have it up here. Thou art my son. And I, I have references to the son. I also have references way up here at the beginning to the Messiah, against his Messiah. And whoever this Messiah is, or whoever this son is, thou art my son, if you accept the son, verse 12, if you kiss the son, if you accept the son, that's like accepting the Lord. If you reject the son, that's like rejecting the Lord. So who can this be? Okay, this is the, the pattern that the Old Testament is already creating for us questions. Who is this Messiah? Who is this one that has this special relationship to God, the Son? Right? And how are these pieces fitting together? How do we understand? All right, well, that's just the beginnings of the Old Testament information, because now we keep on going, and the New Testament opens up and starts to give us some answers who this Son is. The New Testament opens by identifying the Son. He is not only the Son of, the, of God, but he is the son of the Father. And you see this concept in John constantly. Jesus' relationship with the Father. He was sent by the Father. He fulfills the mission of the Father. He is the way to know the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, in Matthew, even refers to the Father. In Matthew eleven twenty-five to 27, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You have hidden these things from the wise and understanding, revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, such was your gracious, gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son, anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. If you're highlighting in here for the words Father and the words Son, they're all over the place in here. Right? Now, here's something that I think is worth knowing or just remembering. It's not like son-father language was just a normal thing to say about God in Jesus' time. Okay, so in 2020, I have my New Testament, we read the Bible, we're familiar with some of this stuff, but um, we say something like, God is our Father, that sounds normal to us. Or I say, my Father, my Heavenly Father, that sounds normal to us. That was not normal when Jesus was speaking to his listeners. And for him to say something like, God is my father, or I am the son of the father, this kind of language was really shocking language. Let me show you why I say that. They would have been surprised that Jesus would dare say this. Here's an example in John. Not only was Jesus breaking the Sabbath, he was even calling God his own father, and here's the way they view this, making some, himself equal with God. And so because of that, they want to kill him, because he dares to call God his own father. Right. In other words, the language of saying, God is my father or my heavenly father, this would not be normal language for them. Jesus is using really unusual language to refer to himself in relationship to the Father. I keep on going and I get into Acts and I start seeing things like this. Jesus promises to send the prop, the, from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is sent by the Father. I get into the epistles and I see words like grace to you and peace from, and this is a pattern at um, almost all of the New Testament epistles. Peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Or we'll see, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things. Or he is the Father of spirits. Or he is the giver of all gifts. He is the one Father and of all who is over all, through all, and in all. So I get a lot of ideas, a lot of repeating. The Father, the Son, God the Father, Jesus Christ. And then finally, I have a huge category of passages that are, that are going to say things like, The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father that gives us new birth, eternal comfort, love, faith, who sent his Son into the world. Okay, so all of these passages that are going to talk constantly about the Father and his relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's going from the Old Testament all the way up into the New Testament, the track, that I'm having, I'm having over and over again, Father, Son, which is God relating to Jesus Christ. 
the Father relating to Jesus Christ. The next pattern I'm going to get, though, is a shift now from the Father in relationship to Jesus Christ to the Father in relationship to us. And here, I summarize this with the heading, to them gave he the right to be called sons of God. Relationship with the Father is not just limited to the Messiah, but now Jesus Christ has brought peace with God so that we can be called children of God. Okay? Jesus speaks in Matthew of my Father, Jesus, his relationship with his Father. Then it shifts it shifts over into your father. And the idea goes because Jesus has a relationship with the father, his father, we can have a relationship with the father so that he becomes our father. The only reason he is my father, the only reason I can say, God, my heavenly father, is because Jesus has invited me into that relationship. I can be called sons of God, a son of God or a child of God only because Jesus, the Son of God, invited me into that relationship. We discover in the Gospel of John, constantly speaking of the Son and the Father over and over again. At the end, we discover that suddenly, and there's a turn in chapter 20, I am ascending to my Father, listen to this progression, and your Father, my God and your God. And here at the end of the gospel, then we're discovering it's not only possible for Jesus to refer to God as his father, now it's possible for me to refer to God as my father. The epistles do the same thing. So in the epistles, we discover that our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. We have relationship with him now. In the garden, Jesus spoke, Abba, Father. In the epistles, we discover we can speak, Abba, Father. We can speak to the Father in our prayers. And therefore, because he's our Father, it controls our whole lives. Now, we are children of God. We must live as children of God, because God has made us his children. All right, summarize some of that. Four steps, or kind of four pieces of the progression. First progression in Scripture talking about Father. Scripture talks about God as Father over all. He's the Father to the entire creation. Okay, so in one sense, we can say God as fathering, taking care of, um, providing for the entire creation. Okay, and so, you know, there's birds outside my window. God is taking care of them, that kind of concept. But the second layer is that God is particularly in this relationship as Israel's father, or Israel is his son. And the notion goes, God has made a special relationship with Israel that he would take care of them, he would guide them, he would direct, he would provide for them, except they failed. So like a good father, what does he do? He disciplines them, right? He rightly disciplines them for their failure. And the result of that is the real son, the faithful son, is actually not Israel at all. It's Jesus. I can't go too far down here, but there's a pattern with this. If you pay attention to a lot of ideas in the Old Testament, there were things that were towards Israel, and Israel failed. Jesus fulfills what Israel should have done. Jesus is what Israel should have been. Okay, that's true here. Israel was God's son, or should have been. But Israel was God's disobedient son. So the Messiah is the true and faithful son. Or another way of saying it, he is the son. Not just a son. The son. And because of that, here's, here's an idea I really hope you'll take from our time together. Because of that, God is the father of every believer Okay, and so that the reason that I can call myself a child of God is because I'm united with Christ. It's my relationship with Christ that makes it possible for me to use language like child of God. And it's that connection that is the only reason for it. Let me show you, just so you understand the concept of union with Christ, I want to talk about that for a second so that you get this idea 
and then that will connect in with uh, the, the Son of God language. So important to me with understanding union with Christ and what that means. Jesus Christ relates to, let's move this down, relates to the Father, the Father as the eternal God, Jesus Christ also as God. But God the Father, Jesus Christ has relationship to him as the Son. Maybe I'll do this all caps, the Son. Okay. So this is a unique and distinctive relationship. Only Jesus has this relationship to the Father. Here's the thing that makes it so amazing, is that the union with Christ idea is that people, human beings, become united with Christ, or they become one with Christ, and the result of their oneness with Christ now is that they are also now children of God or sons of God. It's only in their connection with Jesus that this, uh, this is possible. Jesus is the Son. Only he is the Son. But we have become children of God. And that children of God relationship is strictly in relationship or strictly because of this union with Christ. If you are united with Christ, you are a child of God. Why? Because he is the Son. If you're united with him, you are now a child also. If you're outside of Christ, if you're disconnected from Christ, you have no such relationship with God. You can't call him your father. Right? It's only as you are united with Christ that you now become a child. Because Jesus is the son, then you are now also a child of God. Okay? That connection, I think, helps us understand how some of these pictures fit together. All right, I'm looking down through a couple of questions that we had here. I want to make sure I cover some of these. Um, saying that God is their father is not normal language for Jews. How about the verse where Jesus says the Jews claim that they are sons of God? Really, they are the son of the devil who is, the, who is a liar. Yes, I would expect that um, Israel corporately would refer to, because the, Israel is my son, that kind of idea. But to directly address God as my father, that kind of language is new. So I can go into the Old Testament and I can find Israel is my son. Um, and therefore, things like the passage you brought up, John 8, 41 to 44, um, where it talks about we have one father, even God. But it's corporate. It's as a group. We have one father. I think the idea of I have my father, I am a son of the father, that kind of direct individual instead of corporate as a nation. I think that's the distinction. And that Jesus' use of that language was different, which is a big deal. I think even your intuition gets this if you think about um, like this. If I say, uh, we are children of God, does that bother you? No, that's biblical language. Okay? If I say, you are a child of God, does that bother you? No, that's biblical language. If I say you are the son of God, does that bother you? Yes, <laughs> right? Because as soon as I switch to the son of God, I went off the rails, right? I, that, oh no, right? And it's because the son of God language is different than just you are a child of God. Okay, so I think that's some of how this would sound to Jesus' original Jewish readers, to re refer to God directly as my father is a little, whoa, a little bit shocking, a little bit further. Um, oh, this is a good question from Joyce. The Israelites in the Old Testament cannot be referred to as children of God because they are not yet united with Jesus. It's a great question. And Joyce, what you did here um, takes us in this, it's good, takes you in this, this struggle that we have across the Testaments. So it's sort of like this, and I'm sorry if this is a little bit more, too much detail, you can kind of sit back and take a mental break or something if you want. But I'll toss out some ideas because Joyce asked the question. Um, how do we talk about God justifying people in the Old Testament before Jesus died? How do we talk about them being regenerated before the Spirit has come? How do we talk about them receiving a new heart before the new covenant has been begun. Okay. So this thing happens across the Testaments that's 
challenging. And the answer goes, some of the benefits of the New Testament had to be brought back into the Old Testament early. God would already justify people on the basis of a sacrifice that had not yet been made. I mean, that's the only answer we have. God already justified because he knew in the future Jesus will die. Or another way of saying it is God's view of time is very different than ours, right? In, in my framework of time, XYZ event has not yet happened, so it's not yet real. That's the way it feels to me. If it's not yet happened, it's not yet real. Whereas to God, it's equally real. <laughs> Time's no barrier to him. Um, uh, to me, something a month from now is not yet real because it has not yet occurred. But something on the other side of the room, like, you know, here's my magnets from earlier. On the other side of the room, well, that's real. I can see it. It's right over there. All I have to do is travel over there. Well, what if for God, traveling across time is just like reaching across a room, right? He just reaches across a few centuries. I, I think that's probably the way that uh, a, a way that our minds can try to understand a little bit about how God relates to time. So something like that. And on that basis, then, Joyce, I would say individual Israelites who trusted in the coming Messiah, individual Israelites who trusted in the coming Messiah were children of God. Now, they may not have known to use that language because the New Testament had not yet revealed it, but they were. <laughs> They were children of God, even if they didn't know it. And they would be children of God based on the thing that Jesus would do in the future. So, good question. And um, you asked about something. It was a good question, asking about something that kind of goes into a little bit of a deeper level and attaches into a bunch of other theological questions. That's good. It's a good question. All right, any other questions? I'm happy to talk about them if you have questions. If not, I will keep on moving. Okay, here's an excellent uh, question I want to address. Someone asked me here about 1 John 5, 7, if that's a good verse to use for the Trinity. And um, it, it's not directly part of our discussion here. We're talking, uh, but we're talking about the Father and the Son. So it's, it's very relevant. It's a good question. Um, here's the passage she's talking about. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. There are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree in one. I'll put in parallel on the other side, one of the modern translations. Um, so, here we go. The modern translation on this side, so I'm looking at verse 7 here. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Here's a modern translation. There are three that testify, and then it keeps on going. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree. Okay. Um, I don't have, I can't go too far into this, but I'll give you enough information on it. Um, there's question about whether the last part of this verse was something that was added. And there's actually decent reason to think that the last part of that verse, the words, um, the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, there's decent information or argument to be made that those words were added about around 500 years ago. Um, and those then coming down are included in depending on the translation you're looking at. So that's why the modern translation is not including those words in the verse. And that's why the King James is including those words in the verse. And the question goes, are those words part of the original or are they not? Now, regardless of your decision, if you under your understanding of it is, Yes, they are original, or no, they're not. I would suggest that that verse is not going to be a good one to use in having a discussion with a Jehovah's Witness or a Iglesia Mi Cristo. Going to that verse, they're going to know about it. I promise you the Jehovah's Witnesses will know about it. They've been trained about it. So if you go to that verse, they're going to pull out, out and say, well, no, that's not in some of the translations, and we don't think that was in the originals, and you're just going to end up in a big argument over that. Okay. When the reality is you don't need 1 John, 5, 1 John 5, 7 in order to prove the Trinity. It's all over the place. Okay. You've got tons of verses all over the New Testament you can go to that tell you these three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all over the place. So I would say for the sake of argument, as you're arguing with a Jehovah's Witness, why go to a verse that is going to become a big distraction 
and going to be a, a controversy on the wrong things. Go to any one of the tons of verses all over the place that talk about the three persons of the Trinity without having this issue. Right? That would be my recommendation. And it's just a practical one because otherwise you're going to get into a distracting debate. Okay, um, good. Uh, someone asked here, it's a good question, in 518 the Jews were angry because Jesus said God was his father. They didn't want him, he was making himself equal with God. Does that mean that the Jesus believed that the Son and the Father, that the Jews believe the Son and the Father are equal? Yes. I, I think that's part of the argument here. Whatever is going on in a Jewish person's head, to say that you are the Son of God is not just saying, oh yeah, well, we're all sons of God. That's not what they're thinking. When you say you are the Son of God, you just you just made yourself the yung talagang pinaka siya mismo. Yung tanging anak ng Diyos. You just made yourself the son, the, the unique son of God. And to do that is claiming equality with God. So, Danielle, very good, um, very good point or question here, which is, in a Jewish framework, son of God is not just like, well, we're all children of God. The son of God is a very, very much stronger, higher claim. And that's what the Jews are reacting. That's what they're looking at and saying, you, you don't dare say that. Good. Some great questions there. All right. If I can, I'll do uh, one more section here and then take a break. How's that? And the section we would be looking at here is what does father, the, the father language mean? Like when, when scripture uses the wording father, why that wording? Why did it choose to use that language? And... What we'll end up with are a couple of ideas. First of all, God as Father means he is the source of creation and life itself. Okay, so you have passages that say, is he not your father? He created you, he made you, he established you. Isaiah compares the father to a potter working with clay. We are the work of your hand. Or in the New Testament, he is the father from whom are all things and for whom we exist. Okay, so... Um, fatherhood, you can see some like kind of parallels here. Okay, fatherhood, you came from your father, right? Um, the, your father is part of the source of your existence or something. I mean, your existence is connected to your father. So it's that sort of notion. From God came all things. He is the source of all things. He's the beginning of all things. But if I do it like that, that's actually a little bit impersonal, as in, okay, just concept number one, God is the source of all things. It could be kind of like, um, I just, oh, this is terrible. I just read, I just saw this um, Churchill, Winston Churchill made a comment about his upbringing. Winston Churchill was this British prime minister back in uh, World War II. And someone asked him about his upbringing, and he says, my father was like God. He was always somewhere far away, busy with other things. Okay, it's a really horrible, blasphemous statement. Um, but what he was, you know, he was trying to say about his father, that his father was distant and was always focused on more important things and didn't care about him. And that's, that's a concept called deism. It's a view of God that he created the world and then he just went off. He created the world, he kind of got it going. Okay, now the, the earth is moving around the sun. Okay, that'll take care of itself now. And God is gone. So God is now distant. He's not watching us. He's, he's not paying attention to us anymore. Okay, that sort of idea. Um, if I'm understanding that first concept of the Father, and I just leave it there, it could sound like that's the way God is impersonal, distant. Right? He's, he's the father that is too busy with other things. Well, here now, let's keep on going. The image of fatherhood is hardly impersonal. The second concept is deeply relational. So this is now father as in, we could say something like a good father. The father loves his people. He is the father of the fatherless. Uh, Jesus argues that if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, 
how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I mean, so I'm, a, I'm an earthly father, and if my kids need something um, right now outside my window, my son is cutting a board because he wants to make a sword out of a piece of wood. We had an old piece of wood somewhere, and he saw it. And so he's got a saw, and he's trying to cut it so he can make a sword. Well, yesterday I saw him. He was working hard, and he made, like, that much progress. So I went outside, and I cut the rest of his board on one side for him to try to help him finish it. Why? I just, anyway, I want him to, I want him to be able to have his sword. I care about him. I, you know, okay, but I'm a sinful father. I'm a selfish father. And, and Jesus' argument is, even though you're selfish fathers, you still do nice things for your kids. Okay? Even though you're selfish. How much more? Your heavenly Father who has no sin. Well, when he's doing that, then Jesus' argument is not just Father as in powerful provider, but it's Father as loving relationship. Um, this also implies that there is a group of people who are his true children, so that it's, it's not just everybody is a child of God. And so we see passages like this. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Or one of the passages here, maybe this is uh, something we, we could benefit by looking at. Matthew 5 is an interesting one, where Jesus says that they should be, they should be kind and they should, um, they should treat even those who persecute them, treat them with kindness, that you may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. Why? Because he's kind. He makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. So since God is kind, you also be children of your father. Well, what does that say? It says that not everybody is a child of the father. Right? There is a smaller group of people that are actually God's children. Just being a human does not make you a child of God. Right? There's a smaller group of people. Uh, here we find assurance that we can call out to him as Abba, Father, if we are believers. All right, so concept number one was God is Father over all creation. He takes care of the creation. Concept number two is God is Father to those he has a relationship with. So it's not just taking care of, providing the source of, but it's also relational, loving. Third, there's a concept of chastening or discipline. So we discover here God threatens with, um, with Israel now. If they disobey him, they will be chastened. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastises every son whom he receives. So good fathers also chasten when their children sin. Okay, put all of these ideas together. Here's the three ideas we just had. God is the source of all things. He has a caring relationship. It's not just that he created the world and left, but he cares for us. And then third, the concept of chastening. These are the three ideas we just talked about. Now, if you recognize these four ideas over here, these are the four ideas we talked about before. We talked about creation, then Israel, then Jesus Christ and believers. The progression being God as creator over all things. He is the father of all creation, but especially he has a special relationship with Israel. He's the father of Israel. Israel is my son. Except, we saw, Israel sinned and failed so Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Special relationship even further with the Father. And because of Jesus, believers also can have a relationship with the Father. Okay, so that was the progression we got. Those four steps. And those four steps with these three concepts of meaning. I can put these in a grid because I can do different passages. I can find passages that support creation, source of all. Creation, caring relationship. I can find passages... Israel as the source, Israel came from God, or caring a relationship or chastening. So I can find some interesting patterns here. Um, here's the thing that's interesting about these patterns. Two things. Up here, I don't have God chastening creation. That wouldn't make sense, would it? Because it's not like God punishes creation. Uh, creation itself doesn't sin like that. So anyway, that wouldn't that wouldn't make sense now, would it? Um, but I have two other squares here that are not filled in, and it's with Jesus. Jesus as coming from God, God as his source, 
I don't really have passages that talk about God is the source of Jesus. I do have those passages you saw, the Father gives life. We'll talk about those later. But not that Jesus comes from God and God is his source. Nor do I have passages that talk about Jesus being chastened by the Father, which also wouldn't make sense, would it? Would it? Because Jesus doesn't sin. Okay, so the lack of these passages in these two blocks is interesting and that's what I want to talk about after the break. There's something that it's leading us to understand. Something special is going on here, specifically with Jesus and his relationship with the Father that stands apart. Okay, uh, I'll stop there. I want to just see if I had some questions in the chat here. Okay, good. Um, Mamedith was just asking, so a father of Israel is used in the context of Israel as a nation, not Israel individually. That's correct. So it's the distinction between corporate Israel. Israel is my son, but not really the language of an individual Israelite is my child. Okay? And fitting to Mom Joyce's question earlier, technically any Israelite like David, Abraham, and so forth who accepted the coming Messiah is a child of God, technically. Though I don't think Abraham and David could have known that language because it wasn't revealed yet. But technically... Yes, uh, the technical word for it is proleptically. Um, for anyone who's interested, I'll drop that word in the chat. You can, <laughs> you can Google it if you want. Um, but it just means ahead of time. So God granted some of these blessings ahead of time. And that's, a, that's kind of a, a bit more of a, technolo a technical theological discussion. But yes, you're right. Israel is my son is a corporate nation kind of thing instead of an individual all right, um, if there aren't, well, I'll just stop now regardless. If you have questions, drop them in the chat. We'll take the next 10 minutes. This is a time if you want to take a question or two, drop it in the chat and I'll interact with you there. And then we'll come back in 10 minutes. So I have 1033. I'll see you back at 1043. 1043, we'll pick up where we left off. And uh, as you have questions during the break, I'm happy to look at them in the chat. All right, see you in a bit. If you're ready, I'm ready to go. Even if you're not ready, I'm ready to go. So let's just do it. Um, so where we had left stuff before was in this table. We were looking at a table that um, gave us the three, kind of the, the meaning of Father, that he's the source, that he is it's caring relationship, and even that he chastens. So we had those three, and then on this side, we had creation, Israel, Jesus Christ, and believers. And we were able to demonstrate each one of these. Oh, well, how about this? I'll just pick one. So let's say uh, here, Hebrews 12, 6. The, this is, so the, you see how this block works. This is uh, believers chastening. Okay? So we're trying to see the concept of Father and that God chastens believers, or what that would mean. And if I was going to look at Hebrews 12, verse 6, if I go there, then I would discover that that is this statement. Um, the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens every son whom he receives. Okay. So it's the concept, the father, the well, I should back up, actually, if we go just a little bit further back. It's going to use the language of the father. Um, uh, well, actually, sorry. Uh, God is treating you as sons. What son is there whom his father does not discipline? We have earthly fathers. Shall we not much more be subject to the father capital, the father of spirits and live? Okay, so father capital. And back here then he's talking about what does a father do? And the answer is a father disciplines. See. Okay, so that represents what I said here earlier in this chart. I'm just trying to show you how the chart works. That the father chastens believers. See, and that passage supports it. So that's what we were just noticing. Okay, then we were noticing that there weren't really any good passages that would fit these two categories. Chastening, because how would the father chasten his son? Okay, well, process that for a little bit. Did the father ever chasten, discipline his son? And this is where the, comp the information gets a little complicated, doesn't it? The father would not chasten his son, Jesus, because the son has no sin. At the same time, 
we do find passages that talk about Jesus stricken, smitten, and afflicted. We do find Jesus crying out to the Father that this cup would pass from him. The thing is, Jesus was not chastened for his own sin. He was chastened for our sins. And if you read the context of Isaiah 53, of course, he was chastened for our transgressions. The chastisement for our peace was on him, right? The punishment that should have been mine, Jesus suffered those things. So I discovered that in a way, the father did chasten or discipline or punish the son, not for his sin, but for mine. And even statements like, at the end of his death, father, into your hands I commit my spirit. In other words, um, an idea we'll talk about here the climb later on the climax of the relationship between father the climactic moment the place where it reaches its it reaches its very highest point its most dramatic point is the crucifixion and you never have a time that is more dramatic than that in terms of the whole picture of our of the payment that Jesus made for us it's incredible okay um I'm going to keep on going then. That's, that's, this is what we've done so far, kind of summarizing all of our ideas. What is the meaning of Father, these concepts? Who does he have a relationship with as Father? Those four categories. But here's a new, new problem or a new thing that we have to struggle through. One of the foundations of the doctrine of the Trinity, each of the three persons is fully God. And we can find that in a lot of passages. It's easier to, easy to prove. It's also easy to prove that the Father is distinct from the Son that they're all distinct from each other. Okay. But the thing that's really hard is what comes next. And that is passages that sound like the Father is not equal to the Son. Okay, because we read things like this. What does Jesus mean when he says that the Father is greater than I? That's a statement. That's from the Bible. The Father is greater than I. The Father has granted the Son also to have life in himself. The Son can do nothing of his own accord. Or he, I know. So he does nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the Father doing. Or Jesus says, I do nothing on my own authority. Like, or he at least is saying, I don't do anything on my own authority, but I speak just as the Father taught me. So when I read those passages, all of those passages kind of sound like Jesus is something less than fully God, right? And so now we're kind of scratching our heads. Or if you hear and you have a conversation with a person who denies the deity, they might bring up some of these passages. Okay. There are a couple of answers to these. One answer is just to show from other passages that Jesus is fully equal with God. And I can see that in the paragraph up here. So Jesus will say things like, Have I been so long with you? You still do not know me. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus says, I can't show you the Father. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. In other words, show you the Father I am showing you the Father. What do you think I was here to do? Like, I show you the Father, right? I mean, uh, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has declared him in John 1. See, So, I am the declaration of the Father, is his argument. Jesus teaches that he and the Father are one. They share the same glory. They have the same authority. They have existed together from all eternity. Jesus even made himself equal with God. Okay, so one answer to these passages down here that sound like Jesus is less than God, one answer is just to go up and look at these other passages. The problem I have now, though, is that I kind of end up like these passages against these passages, right? And that's not good. In other words, you don't want to be... A, a conversation with a Jehovah's Witness can turn into exactly that. It can turn into, he brings his path. What about this? What about that? What about what? What about that? So he throws his passages out there. You're like, hmm, yeah, but I have my passages. What about that? What about... So what are you doing now? You're just throwing passages at each other. 
And the question now becomes, wait, it, does Scripture we speak with one voice? Or does it contradict itself? Okay. The Jehovah's Witness is glad to ignore your passages, and that's not good, because he shouldn't ignore your passages. He should read the whole Bible. But before we accuse him of being guilty of ignoring your passages, are you ignoring his passages? In other words, if I'm going to claim to be the the faithful student of Scripture, I really have to understand all of the passages, not just the ones that sound like they fit my side. <laughs> right? Okay. So it is, it's not just good, it's critical. It's a responsibility. Not just to, okay, well I have a different set of passages, but to actually make an effort to understand all of the passages. God gave us his word. He gave us all of his word. All of scripture is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness, which means we should try to understand all of it. We should try to understand all of it. So what do these passages mean? I do still have these difficult passages that sound like Jesus is less than God. We need to understand them. What do they mean? Here are three I think three. I don't remember what I read. Um, looks like two. <laughs> two headings. Uh, yeah, because I combined one of them. Um, two headings that are the categories that we use for understanding these. And the first is this. These passages, many of them, seem to describe Jesus' voluntary submission during his incarnation. Jesus' voluntary submission during his incarnation. Okay, um, what's going to really help us here, and I'll come back to this, would be, let's try an analogy. So, 12 years ago, uh, my wife made me the happiest man in the world because she, uh, she agreed to marry me. And in agreeing to marry me, she did, she did commit herself to follow me. Um, so that was part of the, dis the, the, the promises that we made to each other. I, for my part, promised to love her in sickness and in health and to care for her. So we made these promises to each other. They were self-binding promises, right? In other words, up to that moment, either of us could have just said, never mind, and walked away, right? You know, you come up to the contract, okay, I don't want to sign. Well, it's off. Rip up the contract. I mean, if it's not signed, it's okay. And in terms of a marriage, until the promise is made, there is no promise. I mean, okay. So she voluntarily made the choice. I voluntarily made the choice, and we bound ourselves at that point. And at that point now, right after we make those promises, <laughs> you don't tear up the contract. It's, it's, it's locked down now, right? It's permanent now. But it was a voluntary choice up to that moment. Okay. I think something like that's going on here. Jesus' voluntary submission to the Father. It is a chosen submission to the Father. Um, does that mean that Jesus is inferior to the Father? No, my wife is not inferior to me, right? No one would want to say that like a woman is inferior because she chooses to submit. Actually, that would be an expression of uh, security, of, um, what do you say? Anyway, there's, a, there's an expression of trust and significance in that. That a person says, I trust the Lord, I trust this person, I will choose to submit myself. Right? There's a bigness in that, actually, that's pretty amazing. Um, so nobody wants to say that's a sign of inferiority. And it's that kind of notion. Jesus voluntarily submitted himself to the Father. But there is one other component. Notice it's not just voluntary, but it's also chronologically bracketed. It's chronologically bound. Jesus voluntarily submitted himself during his incarnation. So there's two concepts in that, right? It was a cho voluntary parang, uh, choice. Yeah. He chose to do it. And on the other side, it was during saloob ng ano, baiksing panahon. During saloob ng buhay niya. And during that period of time, it was his choice to voluntarily submit himself to the Father. Um, so we can see some of these confidence, um, some of these con con or concepts underneath here. For instance, John 10, 36. The Father consecrated and sent the Son into the world. Okay? A consecrated cannot mean that he was sinful. The idea is that the Father set Jesus apart. 
by affirming that Jesus was the one he had sent. It is also clearly not possible that this means Jesus came into existence. Actually, scripture is very, very clear. Jesus has always existed, right? And so when we see that the Father sent the Son into the world, it means that the Father from eternity dwelt with the Son, but at that point, then the Father commissioned the Son to enter the world. Likewise, then that's the idea when Jesus says the Father has granted the Son also to have life in himself. It cannot mean that the Father created the Son. Because I have multiple passages that tell me that the Son existed from all eternity. Right? It cannot mean the Father created the Son. It has to mean during the time of Jesus' earthly life. And so the notion would go, during the time of Jesus' earthly life, every breath he breathed, every beat of his heart, every moment of his life, just like you and me, every moment I have that I am alive, every second of his life, the Father granted that to him. The Father gave him life during his earthly life. And the incredible thing about that is that that's a voluntary choice of Jesus to humble himself. Why? Because Jesus is the life. Right? John 1 started off this way. In him was life. Jesus is the source of all life. So even though Jesus is the source of all life, he still chose to depend upon the Father to give him life. Okay? Uh, maybe another comparison will work here. How about this? Um, so most of you don't realize this, but uh, my wife is actually a secret billionaire. Just kidding, she's not. But let's say that she was. Um, so let's say that before we were married, my wife had a long and successful um, career as a CEO of a Silicon Valley startup. And so she earned a billion dollars and she had this massive bank account. Okay. So then, then, <laughs> then she meets me, a poor starving grad student. And let's say that at that point she decides that she, the billionaire, wants to meet, marry the poor starving grad student. But she at some point thinks through this, and she decides, you know, if I marry this grad student, and I'm a billionaire with all this money, and then I come in, and it's like, you know, I'm just going to support him, or whatever, that's going to be a little awkward for the relationship. That'll be weird. So she decides that she's just going to take her billion dollars, and she's going to put it in a trust fund somewhere. And instead, she's going to choose to depend on me to provide for her sustenance. Okay, even though she has this incredible fund all of her own. Okay, now, um, you know, if 30 years from now I find out that my wife secretly did that, then we'll, we'll all be shocked. You know, she'll whip out this trust fund of a billion dollars. That I'm pretty sure none of this happened. But it's an illustration. All right, Jesus Christ has all power. He has all life. Right? He can provide for himself. Uh, my, I guess my illustration breaks down there because it's not, I called myself a poor grad student, so that wouldn't work. Um, but Jesus, instead of exercising his own power, turns to the Father. And he depends on the Father's power for every breath of life he had. So Jesus at any point could just say, fine, I'll provide for myself, right? In the wilderness with the, the stones and so forth. He could just turn them into bread. He could just provide for himself. Instead, he humbles himself and he chooses to depend strictly on the Father's power to do something he could do completely himself, okay? I think all of that is the notion that we have going on here when we read about that Jesus depended on the Father for his life. The Father has granted the Son also to have life in himself has to refer to his earthly life. Okay, another set of passages that works like this refer to Jesus' earthly ministry. He did not come on his own accord. He was sent by the Father. He ministered according to the Father's will, by the Father's authority, spoke the Father's words. Um, the idea cannot be that Jesus is less than divine or less than God. The idea here, this is really what you've got to get here, Jesus did not minister independently. It's not like he just came to earth and this is my ministry. His was, here I, this last phrase, his was not a solo ministry. Jesus ministered by the power of the Father 
the Father is directing his ministry. And that is to show you that the work that Jesus did during his life, his ministry, was together part of the council of the Trinity. It was not a, just a Jesus thing. It was the Trinity. It was God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. That ministry was one. Right? All of that is locked up in this idea of Jesus depending on the Father for life, for his commission, and so forth. Okay, so that's one set of explanations. Any questions there? That's going to help you with some of those passages. When you read these passages that are, whoa, what? Part of your answer is this is a temporary thing during Jesus' incarnation. That's the question you always want to ask. If you were being challenged by a Jehovah's Witness, then the, the framework of the conversation would go, yes, okay, this is true. This, the Father granted Jesus to have life as long as you also can still include the fact that Jesus had life in himself, that Jesus existed eternally, that Jesus created all things, and so forth. Okay, I'm going to look at a couple of questions here. Hebrews 5, 8, uh, though he were a son. I'm not quite following. If you're able to help me understand the question, I don't think I quite get it yet. Uh, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Okay, I think I, I think your question is going in the framework, why the although? It's like, um, even though he was a son, he learned obedience. If, I, if I'm getting the question, understanding the question correctly, the framework would go like this. Um, although he was a son, Jesus was the son of God. So as the son of God, he did not need to suffer. He did not need to learn. He's the son of God. He has all authority, all power. He has everything. But even though he was a son, he still learned obedience through what he suffered. Okay? And so the, the base, I, here I'll try paraphrasing it like this. Even though, verse 8, even, I'm paraphrasing now. Even though Jesus was fully God, he still humbled himself. And he still learned obedience. He learned things, and he still suffered, even though he was fully God. I think that's the framework or kind of the thought of the verse. So hopefully I'm, I'm answering the right question there. Um, okay, <laughs> uh, Joyce, another question that's launching us out into much, uh, much deeper waters. Um, she asked here, did Jesus only volunteer to be subject unto the Father during the Incarnation? If so, was he not before the Incarnation? And Joyce, you're asking me a question that exploded into a massive debate in 2016. It was, uh, within evangelicalism, it was a debate over the eternal subordination of the Son. You can actually search for that if you want some time. And it was, there were conferences on this. There were books written on this. Um, it was very, very controversial. And the question was exactly what you just asked. So... I mean, we're talking very big name professional theologians from big schools and all that stuff like that. And um, a very large group of them said that no, the subordination or the submission of the Son was a temporary thing during Jesus' incarnation. Another group of them said no, it was an eternal thing. Jesus was eternally submitted to the Father. And uh, they all debated, and, and it was uh, it was actually kind of ugly at times and um, then it got done and uh, there's not any clear conclusion so there you go you can read all of that listen to all of those mp3s watch the videos uh, there's entire conferences and books um, I'm not entirely sure where I come down on that discussion oh if you're interested there is a two-hour lecture we did with it this was ACACS and we just had a conversation about this a friend of mine and I talked through some of this for about an hour or two um, and so you can get some information there, and uh, that's it. I'm, I won't say one way or the other. I'm undecided uh, about that particular question. So that, that, <laughs> that answered it sufficiently. I'll drop the link in here in the chat later. But yeah, you asked a question that like launches us out in this huge debate thing <laughs> that happened. So good. Um, the question on Hebrews 5.8, if the sonship of Jesus ceased... Uh, Oh, I see. Why a son and the son? Okay, two answers. One, no. Jesus' sonship did not cease. He's definitely still the son. Um, 
that's an interesting question. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. I'd have to think about, we're going to get into, uh, um, what do you call these? Uh, what do you call the circles where you have overlapping Venn diagrams here? If you are the son of God, then you are by definition also a son. So that would be one answer to the question. Um, another answer to the question, maybe I should look at the Greek and see if we have an article there. That's also, it's not impossible that, that what we have going on. No, it's just a son. Um, so I don't know. I don't know that there's, I don't know that I want to draw too so much significance out of a son versus the son. Even though he was a son, he learned obedience. Um, yeah, if he is the son, he is also a son. The son is more specific, but the more general is also true. So, all right, I'll keep on moving unless there's more follow-up on that question. Uh, I don't know that there's a whole lot more we'll learn by chasing it down, but I'm happy to interact on it. All right, so the first thing we had was Jesus' voluntarily, voluntary submission during his incarnation. He chose, he chose to accept to submit to the Father. The second thing, this goes a little bit to your question, Abde Joyce, um, which is an eternal relationship within the Trinity. So this is this does matter to me. Joyce asked, was Jesus' submission to the Father an incarnational thing or an eternal thing? To which I answered, you know, that's a little bit still up for grabs. Uh, theologians haven't settled that out, that one out yet. That one's not a, a defined or answered question yet. This is answered, and this is important to me. The Son is not just, the title Son is not just an incarnational thing. The title Son is an eternal thing. That's an important thing. Okay, now whether that includes uh, submission or not, we're not sure. But the eternal thing, it is clear, he was eternally the Son. And there is in this point a kind of order within the Trinity that does seem eternal. So we find things like this. We find the Father is sending the Son. We never find the Son sending the, sending the Father. We find the Son asking the Father, or kind of requesting, and then they together send the Spirit. Jesus teaches, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth. So what do you have here? Um, or I should keep on reading first. Who I send to you, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So you have the Father and the Son together sending the Spirit. Right? Father, Son, together send the Spirit. The Spirit who proceeds from the Father. And the Spirit will bear witness about me. You also see this after Jesus' resurrection. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, Jesus. Having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit... Jesus has poured out what you are seeing and hearing. Okay, so it's connected. The promise of the Father, ascending to the Father, then Jesus and the Father send the Spirit. And we keep on going. We can find this in other places across theology. So, the Father created the world through the Son. By Jesus, all things were created. All things were created for, through him and for him. Uh, the Father sent the Son into the world. The Father directed Jesus' ministry. The Father sent the Spirit at Pentecost. The Father spoke the words of Scripture by the Spirit. Okay, so I'm getting kind of an order here. Father, Son, Spirit. In fact, it's kind of interesting. Typically, when we talk about the Trinity, we do it in that order. We typically say Father, Son, Spirit. Um, if you pay attention to the pattern in Scripture, Scripture does it in lots of orders. So there's not a single order or something like that. Um, but there is an order in this sense that we see a pattern of the Father doing an action through the Son or through the Spirit. There is a pattern like that. In each case, the three persons act as one, and yet in each case the Son and the Spirit are willingly submitted in some way to the Father's headship. So it's, it's not like there's... It's terrible to say... It's not like there's ever any difference or something. You know, if three guys sit down and they're going to be a committee, inevitably there will be times when they have different viewpoints. There's nothing like that. The three are always functioning as one. But there is some kind of something, some kind of order. I mean, a lot of this we're just not sure how to say or what to say. But there is a pattern of some kind of order 
that the Father seems to initiate these things. The Son is, and the Spirit are the means by which he does, does these things. Okay, does that make as much sense as it is profitable to try to make? In other words, I, you know, I, I, I can't fully explain what's going on here. I'm just, just observing patterns, okay? But this is kind of at the edge of what we can know. Um, so I'm not going to be able to answer every question, but does it make sense enough? <laughs> as, much, as much as we're able to understand it, there is some kind of order or some kind of something here in these relationships. All right, if so or even if not, I'll keep on going. And if you have a question, uh, drop it in. Because this is really where this becomes concentrated. Okay? Some of what I've said here could seem like I don't know, okay, those are interesting ideas, but how useful is that? But let's follow out the progression here. The central place where we see this order is the cross. And at the cross, you see the most concentrated discussion, in all the Bible actually, the most concentrated discussion of Jesus' relationship with the Father right before his crucifixion. Okay, we read John 17. John 17 is the end of an entire block, John 14, 15, 16. And 14 through 17, those chapters, those four chapters together, are just full. I mean, I could do it, but it'll take time. They're full of the words Father, Son, Spirit. It's everywhere. And when I get to chapter 17, what we read earlier, I'm actually listening in on a prayer between the first person and the second person of the Trinity. I mean, it's like God gives me an opportunity to listen to two persons of the Trinity and how they talk to each other. Okay, so you don't have any place in Scripture that's richer or more mind-blowing than this section. And it's right before the crucifixion. It's the last events before the Garden of Gethsemane and straight to the crucifixion. Okay. There's a reason for that. It's not an accident. Similarly, we see an, an incredible window into what's going on in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Geth, the Garden of Gethsemane, what are Jesus' words? Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Okay. And so again, I have a prayer between two persons of the Trinity with this struggle, if it's possible but I submit myself to your will. Do you hear that? It's, it's, we're back to our idea of earlier, the voluntary subordination, voluntary submission thing. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Right? And so Jesus submitting himself to the Father's will at that moment. Okay, well, it's coming to a climax. Why? Because it's the, it's the crucifixion. What about on the cross? Three times Jesus cries out, my God, my God. Three times he cries out, and the last time, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, this is one of his last words, and it's, just so you understand that phrase, Jesus is saying that because of my sin and your sin, the Father has turned his back on his Son. The Father has turned away in just, righteous anger. And he's judging the son for my sin. That's what's going on in there. And yet, even though, even though Jesus sees that the Father has turned away, even though Jesus sees that my sin has broken that relationship, he still trusts the Father so that his last words, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Even when the Father has turned away because of my sin, Jesus' trust and confidence is still in the Father as his refuge. If the roles are centered at the cross, what does this tell us about the Father? Isaiah 53 answered, answers this. It was not just that Jesus suffered under some kind of karma thing, but it was actually personal. It wasn't just like the crushing force of justice in general as a concept, a sort of karma justice, but read deeper. It was a personal punishment. Um, there's a difference between if I walked outside my gate and I was walking down a street and like, I don't know, 
a wall fell over and crushed me, right? I mean, that would be, that would be horrible, right? You're crushed by this random accident. But there's a difference somehow between that and someone personally walking up to you, sticking a gun in your face and shooting you. Now it's personal. Something worse about a knife attack, right? Okay, it's personal now. And, and let's make that same distinction here. Jesus' death on the cross is not just like a wall falling on him or impersonal cosmic justice, karma or something. But read carefully Isaiah 53. Why and how does Jesus suffer? It was God who smote him. He was smitten by God. It was God who laid on him the iniquity of us all. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. God voluntarily, it was a choice, it was a decision to crush him. God himself actively put him to grief. Or in the New Testament, God has made Jesus to be sin. Jesus' payment was not made to like an impersonal sort of concept. It was actually, here, it's relational. It was the Father who judged Jesus for our sin. He he was, we used the word chastening, disciplining earlier, he was laying on Jesus actively the punishment for my sin. And the result is that their relationship was temporarily broken by my sin. Their relationship that from all eternity was perfect, the relationships of the Trinity, the original relationship, all right? I mean, you cannot go further back. The original relationship from the beginning of all time was temporarily broken. And what broke it was my sin. But the biblical story keeps on going because God did not just judge Jesus for my sin, but God also will see Jesus' payment and be satisfied. The Father vindicated Christ by raising him from the dead. The Father is the one who glorified him. The Father is the one who exalted him to sit at his own right hand. Okay, you've got to pay attention. It's really important. When you read about the resurrection, notice it's not just like Jesus was dead, then all of a sudden he said, okay, it's time, and he sat up. It's not just that. He did not raise himself by his own power. It's more like this. Jesus was dead. The Father reached forth and raised him. It was the Father's action that raised him. Of course, Jesus had the power to do it, but the Father is the one who did it. And why does that matter? Because what stands at the center of this father-son relationship is the cross, the payment for my sin, and the confirmation that that payment has been made. Okay? Summarizing some of that then, this finally helps us better understand what it means when the Bible says the Father is greater than the Son. Even when other passages describe Jesus as equal. The answer is within the Trinity, the three persons have taken roles. Those roles are voluntary, they're functional, meaning they're for a specific purpose. It doesn't mean that, that someone is lesser or greater, it just means that there is a different purpose. And here we can get something that helps us if we do a kind of, again, an analogy. It's important to remember that headship never means superiority. Okay? Most human relationships are lived within, within structures of authority and submission. So, you know, everybody, everybody has somebody who has an authority over them in some part of their lives, right? I mean, if, even if you're the president of a country, you're still answerable to the voters. <laughs> you're still answerable to the structures around you. Everybody is submitted to something. Well, that doesn't mean then that just because within a certain framework I have a boss or someone has a husband, that doesn't mean that they are inferior. It just means they took a role, right? It's a role that you took in that place for that thing. And there's nothing here about inferiority or superiority. In the same way, Jesus' submission to the Father, his voluntary submission to the Father, does not mean that he is less divine than the Father. It does not mean that he is inferior to the Father. Jesus is, Jesus always has been equal to the Father, even though he voluntarily chose to order himself in relationship to the Father for a period of time. Okay, any questions about that?
any interaction we want to have there. I see one question in the chat. Um, so may, uh, this is just a question. If I may, uh, this came in as a private question, and I'm going to put this, I won't include the name, but I'll just put it in here so that all of us can read it in the chat. Um, you said his struggle in Gethsemane was focused on submitting to his father's will. Um, let this cup pass from me, focusing on the humiliation and the physical su suffering. Um, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Yeah. Now, may, I want to make sure I understand the question, so if you want to follow up here so that I get the question correctly. One thing I would like to just kind of tweak a little bit, sometimes when I hear uh, discussion about the crucifixion, I wish that we did not focus so much on the physical side of the crucifixion. In other words, sometimes in order to make the crucifixion really stand out, then we'll go through, and there, there are books that do this, that'll go through and tell you what it would have looked like with a whipping. Uh, you, do you, some of you, um, The Passion was a movie that came out like, I don't know, a long time ago, 10 years ago, and it was really gory. Um, it was really gory, just lots of blood and stuff. Um, but it was the whole point of it was to make you, you know, see the crucifixion. Wow, look what he suffered for me. Um, it's not an accident that if you read the Bible itself, the Bible itself does not go into a lot. Of, and then blood flew everywhere. It's the Bible doesn't do this. Okay, the Bible just tells you quite clinically. Then they scourged him. It just tells you that, right? Okay. They put him on the tree. They nailed him to the cross. It's, it's almost clinical. And I, I think the reason here goes, if you focus on the blood, um, or just the gore of it or something, you've missed something. The ultimate horror of the cross, yes, I, awful. The physical horror, the physical torture of it. But the ultimate horror of the cross was Jesus Christ cut off from his relationship with the Father. Or another way of saying it, there have been other human beings in the history of the world that have suffered crucifixion, right? There have been other people, actually quite a few. Quite a few people have suffered crucifixion. None of their deaths was sufficient for my sin, right? What was different about Jesus' death? He did not just suffer the physical crucifixion. The physical crucifixion was just a picture. The real horror of the cross was that Jesus was cut off from the Father. And so I think when I'm reading in Gethsemane, that's that's what I want to understand there. When he's saying, let this cup pass from me, that's not just, oh, this, this cross is going to hurt. I mean, it, it did physically hurt. The horror of the cross, though, was being judged for the sins that I did and that you did and being cut off from the Father. That was the real horror. That's the essence of what hell is, separation from God. Jesus experienced separation from God, being cut off from the Father. Um, and then, good question here, uh, Mom Joyce, being cut off from the Father in that short time. He knew he would rise again with the Father again. Why still this anguish? I mean, if, well, I can answer this two levels. Sorry for this, um, but I'll start, start with this on the, on the simplest level. How about this? If you knew that starting in five minutes, you would be in hell for several days, would that trouble you? Yeah, right? Okay. Now, let me jump back really quick. Jesus did not go to hell. I'm not saying that. He did not. Um, but that's the best thing I can give you as kind of a comparison. Because what we're talking about here is Jesus Christ was cut off from the Father he had perfect relationship with the Father forever. And then even for a few moments, cut off from the Father, my human brain doesn't understand the horror of that as he would. But that is the ultimate horror. Another way of saying this, what brought, sin, what brought pain, suffering, and death, the thing that made life on earth yucky in all the ways that life is ever yucky, all the, all the torture and pain and horror of life on planet Earth, that began with sin. Sin did that to us. This was a good world until sin entered the world. Okay, Now, gather up all of that horror, all of that torture, all of those tears, all of that pain. Bring it all together in one place. And that's the, essentially what happened at the cross. 
because all of this sin was brought together in one place, right? Every sin ever committed brought together and laid on him. I mean, anyway, it's incomprehensible worm. It's absolutely incomprehensible. I, I can definitively, authoritatively say this. No human being has ever suffered the tiniest percentage of what Jesus suffered in that moment. It's the essence of suffering. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a singularity of suffering. You know, singularity is a mathematical concept, like a black hole, where, you know, things overfold into themselves, and it's just like an infinite point, okay? It's like a singularity of suffering. No other human being has ever experienced anything comparable. But I think that's the framework I want to use here. Even momentary, yes, but, I mean, incomprehensible horror. Okay. Um, as far as explaining the Father is greater than I, John 14, 28, that's, that's what we were just wanting to work through here. That's basically this, uh, this heading here. So that section is uh, the explanation of what the Father is greater than I. The, the, but to give a kind of a summary heading or sum, summary explanation of that, you have to figure out what greater than I means in relationship to these other statements that Jesus is equal to the Father. So what is greater, equal, how can those two go together? And the answer is, it's just in terms of authority, relationship. So um, greater, maybe in English, greater comes out sounding uh, really focused on like authority, or on significance, dignity, power, glory, things like that. It's not it's just the Father is, um, what do you say, the Father is my head. It's sort of that notion. The Father is in charge. The Father, Jesus is saying, I am submitted to the Father. The Father who has authority. The Father who is over all things. That kind of notion. So it's the framework of what we're talking about in terms of the Trinity. That the Father has the ultimate authority and the Son has chosen to submit himself. Right? Um, kind of like... Uh, if someone said to my wife, could you, you know, would you, would you be willing to do this thing? And she said, well, I really should ask my husband first. Now the irony is that I say the same things. Let me ask my wife first. But in that relationship, then there's a certain, okay, deference because of the way the relationship goes. Well, I really should ask him first. Okay? And I think that's the notion here is the father's authority. Okay. Um, Good. All right. I think I think we're answering most of the questions that we have here. One other question that just came in: His suffering was so great, being he fully knew and appreciated the relation. Yeah. Maybe the concept here goes: Jesus suffering on the cross, his horror in Gethsemane, uh, being cut off from the Father, is measured against what he knows perfect relationship with God. You and I have never even experienced the richness of that, nor have we experienced the depth and the horror of the suffering he suffered. All right, I'm going to do one other section, and then we'll take a break. How's that? Uh, this, section, this section I more will probably leave to you later on. Um, so I'll leave to you later on to read this more thoroughly, but let me just try to summarize it so that you can kind of see what the argument is, and then when you read it, maybe this will make some sense here. Some people have pointed out some passages that they feel are uh, kind of representing a female side in describing God. So maybe uh, one of the closest things to this is a passage in Deuteronomy, and it's going to talk about um, some female or feminine imagery in relationship to Israel. Uh, so we're here, and we read this. Uh, excuse me just a second. Here we go. Um, God says this, Have I conceived all of this people? Have I begotten them? That thou shouldst say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers. That's interesting translation here, because I don't know nursing father. I don't know that the word father would be represented in the Hebrew, but in any case. Um, all right, so you've, here, you've got a passage in uh, Job. Out of whose womb came the ice? You know, womb is definitely feminine imagery. Um, here we've got things like this. Uh, shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb? 
Um, and here you've got uh, language again that's feminine. Okay, so you've got a couple of things. Here's one in Isaiah, as one whom his mother comforts, I will comfort you. This is um, here in Matthew 23, where it talks about a hen. The word is actually specifically like a female, you know, female bird gathers her chickens under her wings and that kind of thing. So you've got people that will look to that handful of passages and say, well, the Bible sometimes uses female imagery of God. And from that, then, there are people who are open, very progressive people, who will say things like, um, we can talk about God as a her, or, you know, she, and that kind of thing. Uh, there's, this gets out there, but there are cults that will have mother God, right? and that's a different thing entirely. Actually, when they say mother God, they are talking about a very specific, living, 65-somewhere-year-old Korean woman. And they're saying that she, that Korean woman, is the mother of God. Um, that's the Worldwide Church of God. It's right up here on uh, Kaleatan Street. And that's very interesting. I had a conversation with them one time. It's a very interesting group. Really, really messed up. So, okay, but some people are going to say something like this. Obviously, we're not going to. I don't think any of us are remotely comfortable with using feminine language of God. But it maybe starts to raise a few questions. Um, is it something like God has something more in common with male humans than female humans? You know, why does, why does the Bible say he and him and so consistently use masculine comparisons, masculine metaphors? Um, so is, is that like expressing an underlying patriarchy in the biblical text or something like that? And I think the answer goes, we should not speak of God as gendered, not like the way that humans have gender. Human sexuality, gender roles are linked to our creation. It's linked to marriage and those roles, family roles, and things like that. Scripture avoids language that would imply notions of gender or sexuality, for sure, to talking about God. Um, scripture allows for parallels between God and humans that are made in his image, but not in respect to gender. So that, okay, but how then do we explain why scripture so consistently uses masculine language? I think the reason is probably male roles are biblically linked to leadership and authority. I think to link God to feminine language would imply some kind of subordination, and that's not going to work. God is, God is under no one's headship. In any case, I don't know exactly why God chose to use masculine language, except this would be my core argument. The way we do theology correctly is that we always speak the way God speaks. So how do I do theology? Try to see how the Bible said it, and then say it like that. That's the goal. All right? The goal of theology is never to be creative, or to invent or correct theology. The goal is to follow the patterns of how scripture itself speaks of God. Okay. And so, whatever the reason, scripture does use masculine language of God. I'm not going to say that God is male. The answer to my question, is the Father male? The answer is no. I don't want to say the Father is gendered. Right? It's not a parallel to male-female, the way that humans are male or female. It's not that at all. But the concept that we would speak of God using masculine pronouns, yes, because scripture itself does that. God is not gendered, because to imply maleness would be almost to imply some other femaleness or something. You just don't want to go there, right? God is one, okay? But you still should use masculine, like let's say him, he, instead of feminine, she, her, language of God, because scripture does that. One last comment here in terms of this, and I'm getting this from, I think, Mom Jennifer. I think we had a conversation. I thought you said this well. Um, let's be careful that we don't turn this kind of discussion into a question like, God is more like me or God is more like you. I'm a man, so therefore God is more like me than you. Okay, what? Um, that's fundamentally broken because before we view ourselves as male and female, more fundamental, I'm a human made in the image of God, you're a human made in the image of God. So really the way to view ourselves is first as humans, and the image of God linked to that. Right? Linked to the fact that I am a human made in his image. 
And then male, female, gender roles, those are, okay, those are real things, but, okay, you know, each of us has different roles and so forth. That's not distinctly connected to these kinds of discussions, who is God. God is not gendered in that sense, even though scripture uses male language. Okay, any questions there? It's probably not, that's probably about as much uh, benefit as we'll get from thinking through some of those questions. Um, I'll maybe pull in one other question here. I'm going to do the same thing again. I'll drop it in the chat so you can read it if you'd like. Um, but someone just asked this. So he quoted John 10, 18. Uh, Jesus says, no man taketh, he's talking about his life. I have the power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment I've received from my father. So the question here goes, um, did Jesus only submit himself to the father when he did have the power to raise himself? And I think I like this, him bringing up this passage. I appreciate that. Jesus depended on the Father for his resurrection. But what that passage reminds you is Jesus could have raised himself. He did have the power. He could have raised himself, but he did not. <laughs> and it fits into the broader pattern across all of the Gospels. Jesus could have turned the, the, the stones into bread. He could have fed himself, but he did not, right? Jesus could have performed all of the miracles by his own power apart from the Father, but he did not. He did these things by the power of the Father. He submitted himself to the Father and all the way to his death, where Jesus submitted himself to the Father and rested on the Father raising him rather than just doing it himself. I think that's the concept. He had the power to do it himself. That becomes a very, very helpful foundation for us thinking about ourselves when I die I will know just as Jesus entrusted his soul to the father I also rest my soul father into thy hands right I mean really that's the concept even Jesus did not just say well I'll act dead for a few days then I'll just raise myself even Jesus trusted the father to raise him so when I get to my final days, gonna then. That's the, also the same kind of trust. I will also entrust myself to the Father. That just as Jesus entrusted himself, I'm also entrusting myself to the Father. Okay, um, I will take a break then now. And as you have questions, put them in the chat during the break. And I'll keep an eye on the chat. Uh, let's come back at 11.48. And this last section will be just shorter because we'll just finish up for the day. So maybe... Uh, what is that going to be like? About 30 minutes or so. So I'll see you back in 10 minutes. Uh, 11.38 or 11.48, we'll pick up again and finish out our last section. Thanks. I'll just read a, a very good question we received. And it's it's actually related to Mom, jo Mom Joyce's question earlier. Uh, the question here, I put it in the chat also. Would we be able to think of Jesus Christ submitting himself to God as a sort of picture to remind us to submit ourselves to earthly authorities with respect toward them as the head, not making ourselves equal with the relationship of God and Son, but simply as a reminder of what sort of respect and attitude we should have. So it's a great question. Um, and that actually, Mom Joyce's question earlier, which was the eternal subordination of the Son, and that whole debate that happened a couple of four, four, four or five years ago, that's actually the context it was, it was launched in because um, the debate was over uh, gender roles, marriage roles. And so there's people who, a big issue within, um, within evangelicalism is how you view submission of women to men and how some of that works out. And there's a whole spectrum of different views on that. Well, one group of people within all of that argued that Jesus' submission to the Father is the example, showing the dignity or, um, yeah, that there's nothing inferior inferior about submission. And another oh, group of people who were less comfortable with the concept of uh, female submission, headship kind of notions, uh, they found, took issue with that, took offense at that. So, yes, Mom. Danielle, you're actually going in the same direction with some of your thoughts there, and it's good. A couple of cautioning comments I have here. One is 
scripture itself never actually points towards the relationships of the Trinity as a pattern for marriage. And I think the reason for that is exactly what you, I, I think you were feeling cautious about this when you wrote it. You said something like not making us equal with the relationship of God and son. Um, I, I think you were saying that because you're feeling a little bit, it's a little bit awkward to just, you know, okay, if, if I'm the leader, then it's like God the Father. Whoa, whoa, you know, that kind of thing. It feels really awkward, right? Well, yes. And I think that's probably why Scripture never points to the Trinity as the, 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 uh, out, like the illustration for marriage. Um, in fact, unless I'm missing something, I'm not coming up with anything where Scripture actually points to the Trinitarian relationship as the foundation for those types of relationships at all. Not just marriage, but any kind of submission to authority type of idea. So I want to be a little cautious about going down that direction. The closest thing I get is that I do get in Peter, um, first, first Peter, it's, it uses the example of how Jesus entrusted himself to the Father under persecution. And it says, like that, you also entrust yourself to the Father. And I can do other things. I can see that Jesus is our example for everything. So Jesus, although he was a son, he learned obedience. I mean, I've got some things like that that sort of push me in the direction. Jesus is our an example in everything. So I don't know that your idea is a bad one. Um, I think it's a fine idea, and I think it's very, I think it's probably fine to point out that uh, even Jesus is, a, is an example of submitting himself to headship. You might, though, be a little safer if you did something like this. Um, you remember the time when Jesus was in the temple when he was seven, eight years old, and, and he's there, seven? No, 12 years old? Anyway, I'm mixing, mixing it up. I think 12. Anyway, he's in the temple and his parents leave them there, leave him there by accident and, he, and they go. Then they come back, they find him. And then it ends out that section and it says, and he submitted himself to them. So you actually have Jesus as a child submitting himself to human authority, human headship. So I'd be a little more comfortable going that way because the text itself explicitly pointed me, and that's now human headship. Jesus submitting himself to human headship, which is really even more amazing, isn't it? So if Jesus submitted himself to my par to his parents, who do I think I am? <laughs> it's like that kind of notion, right? Even Jesus submitted himself to human parents, and he was going to die for their sins. <laughs> okay. He was going to die for their sins, and he still submitted himself to them. Who do we think we are? Um, I think you can do something like that, and then I'll feel I'll feel a lot a lot more confident because I think the text supports me really well there. But I don't think your idea is a wrong one. Uh, it's just it's a it's a little mushier there on how to support it. The biblical data doesn't support me quite as strongly. So good. You guys are asking great questions. Really good, good, thoughtful questions. I, I appreciate it very much. All right, let's look at one more section here, and then Lord willing, I'd love to introduce the next chapter and just show you, kind of show you around a little bit what's going in the next chapter. But this is our last section for this chapter. And the question here goes, which passages refer to the Father? A difficult question when scripture just refers to God, does that mean the Father? Does that mean the Trinity? What does it mean? Who's it talking about? Well, we have sat passages that are really clear. And I should have, you, maybe you can write this in your notes, or I actually edited it for next time. Uh, this first paragraph is showing you that the Father is called God. When Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who is that? It's the Father. And there's lots of passages that do this. Um, if you're interested, down here, I... I pulled in a bunch of passages that do this, but this is actually just a small selection. But if you look at these tons of places where the Bible will just say the word God and it refers to the Father. So that's this. The word God, just God, means Father in some passages. But here it becomes more complex because the word God in either Testament can also refer to Jesus. Isaiah predicts that a child will be born who is the mighty God. John tells us that in the beginning the word was God. Hebrews addresses the Son. Of the Son, he says, 
your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And then an entire group of passages speak of God, our Savior, but it's Jesus in those passages. So I've got paragraph one, when it says God, that can mean Father. Paragraph two, when it says God, that can mean Jesus. That leaves a large group of passages that are not clearly specified either way. So sometimes, I just said, God our Savior sometimes refers to Jesus. Guess what? In another group of passages, that same expression, God our Savior, refers to the Father. And you'd have to look at the passages to see why, but it's pretty clear in the passages that they refer to the Father. And then you have another third group of passages, it's these ones, that have God our Savior, and you're just not sure. <laughs> All right? So same expression, God our Savior. And if you look at the passages, group one, Jesus. Group two, Father. And in the context, because it says, basically, you know, Jesus our Savior, or Jesus who is God our Savior, or God our Savior and Jesus Christ. That's group two. God our Savior must mean the Father. Okay? And then group three, you just don't know. It's ambiguous. And when you put all of that together, then, when Scripture uses the word God... There's a bunch of times when you just you just can't know. Does it refer to one of the persons of the Trinity? Does it Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Does it refer to God as one, God in his unity, all three persons? And the answer is, don't know. Nothing in the context tells me. It gets even more interesting in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, we might assume that every reference to Yahweh in our English translations, it's going to come out L-O-R-D. We might assume that every reference is to the Father. I'll show you one example. How about, how about this? Let's try going to Isaiah 6. And Isaiah 6 is going to be just, seems like a really easy one referring to the Father. So here I saw, uh, when he, the year the King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. And so um, I saw these seraphim, they had six wings, and one cried one to another, saying, Holy, holy is the Lord. This is all caps, so that's Yahweh, Jehovah. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Okay. So who is that? And if you say, that's clearly the Father, um, I completely understand what you're thinking. But I disagree, actually. <laughs> because here, there's a very interesting thing that happens. And it happens in John. John quotes this passage, and we read um, here that he quotes the passage, He hath blinded their eyes, hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes. That's quoted from Isaiah 6. Okay, so it's quoted right from that passage. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. And in the context here, this is talking about Jesus. So what I actually get is this Isaiah 6 back here, one cried to another, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. You can read this Lord of hosts, and you can say, that's Jesus. That's a valid way to read this passage. The Lord of hosts in this passage refers to Jesus. I'll give you one more example. If I do Psalm 110, very famous passage, <clears throat> the Lord, that's Jehovah, said unto my Lord Adonai, that's another word for God, Sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Okay? Jesus later quotes this passage when he's having a conversation with the religious authorities. And Jesus says to them, so who can this possibly refer to? They're all huddled together. How is it that David calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand? How is this possible? To which the answer, if you really have time to develop it, but if you really analyze what's going on here, Jesus' point is, how do you have God talking to God? How's that going to work? Right. And the answer is, because one of these is the Father, and the other is Jesus. In the Old Testament, you've already got some stuff in the Old Testament where God is talking to God. Zechariah 2, God sends God. Yahweh sends Yahweh. Right? You've got these places in the Old Testament where once you understand the New Testament, you realize, ooh, that was actually Jesus. But the Old Testament called him Yahweh, called him Jehovah. And, um, well, I wish I, I wish I could show you. I wish I had time. I'm collecting a document right now where every time I see this between the Testaments, 
I'll see an Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage. New Testament, Jesus. Old Testament, Yahweh. Why? Same person. Okay, maybe I'll throw one example at you. Philippians 2, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, that comes out of Isaiah. And in Isaiah, it says, here, the Lord says, every knee will bow to me, every tongue will confess to me. And it's Jehovah in the Old Testament. And I come into Philippians and I find out, quoted, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That word Lord, by the way, in the New Testament, kurios, is the translation from the Old Testament, Jehovah. They will confess that Jesus is Jehovah. These things are lining up. So when you put that together, you end up with this. When I read in the Old Testament, Jehovah, or when I read in both Testaments, God, or sometimes Lord, and I read those and I go, wait, which one is it? Which one is it? The Father, the Son, or God in general, the three persons? What's going on here? There's a bunch of them where the answer is, could be. Don't know. In fact, the total categories, passages that one, refer specifically to Jesus, two, specifically refer to the Father, or three, they're just, we're not sure which one. What's the explanation, or, or what do we do? How do we read these? The answer is that in the majority of these passages, we don't know, and we can't know. And I think that is part of the richness of the doctrine of the Trinity. In other words, my argument would go here, Scripture makes the distinction clear where it's needed. In the great majority of cases, God can refer to any of the three persons, or it can refer to the entire Godhead, because Jesus, the Father, the Spirit, are all equally and fully God. And so as you read it, you go, no, 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 but which is it? Is it Jesus? Is it the Father? Is it the whole person? And the answer is, it doesn't matter. There's one God. And Jesus is God, and the Father is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And so, right. I mean, that's the way you read some of those. Where it says Yahweh, which one is it? Which one is it? Which what? It's God. There's one God. And Jesus? Sure, yes. The Son? Yes. The Father? Yes. The Spirit? Yes. Right. It doesn't matter. Because that's part of the richness of the Trinity. No further distinction is necessary. It quite literally does not matter. The ambiguity is not a limitation. It's part of the richness of the biblical truth. When you read L-O-R-D in the Old Testament, or God in the New Testament, or Lord in the New Testament, it might be Jesus, it might be the Father, look at the context. But if the context doesn't give you a clue, great. It's that. <laughs> it's the Trinity. It's the three persons, right? And you don't really have to look any further than that. That's part of the richness of the Trinity. Jesus is God, the Father is God, the three persons are God. Okay, any questions on that? Uh, if not, I will just, I'll just keep on, I'll just keep on going. But drop a question in the chat, and I'm happy to interact. I think so far we've been able to answer or discuss every question you've asked. So feel free. I'm really, really grateful to have your questions as we keep on going. Um, all I plan to do here for the next, we'll do about, well, 16 minutes. <laughs> in the next 16 minutes, I want to introduce the next chapter and just show you what it looks like so that you can kind of see just the framework of the chapter, I'll kind of be a little tour guide and show you around in the chapter, and then we'll summarize some of this together and be done for the day. Um, so ch I'm on chapter 15, the person of Christ. Um, just before I answer that question, or go there, let me answer this question that just came in. And uh, maybe just for the sake of all of us, I'll, I'll put it in the chat for us all to read here. Okay, just a second. Here we are. Um, regarding having absolute authority, isn't that an attribute of God? Yes. If so, does it mean that Jesus has lesser authority, that he's not sovereign? Okay, good. And one, you're right, right on with this. This is really good, solid thinking here. Uh, isn't it one of the foundational truths that all of God's attributes are present in each person of the Trinity? Absolutely. So the notion of this would go, um, what do you say? It's not that Jesus has any less authority. 
he chooses, he voluntarily chooses. That's the voluntary part. That's the really, that's the critical part of it. Um, maybe it would be helpful for us to think of this, do you know the expression zero-sum game? Maybe not. Uh, or if you have great, whatever. Um, zero-sum game is maybe a little bit of a nerdy concept, but a zero-sum game is, let's say, if there's, there's a, we're going to play a game, and there's a, a thousand pesos, and we're going to play the game. <laughs> we shouldn't do it. It would be gambling. We're going to play the game, and however many points you get, you get a piece of the thousand pesos, but it's limited. It's set. There's 1,000 pesos, so if you get five pesos more, I get five pesos less. If I get 10 pesos more, you get 10 pesos less. Okay, so it's a zero-sum game because every single point you get is a point I don't get. All right, and so we're dividing up a limited amount. Um, we don't want to think of authority as a zero-sum game, as if the more authority the Father has, the less authority Jesus has. Or the more power the Father has, the less power Jesus has, or something like that. I think a better way to think of it is, let's say there's, there's two guys... They're going to work together on a project. They're equally skillful. They're equally intelligent. They're equally experienced. But just they say, you know what? Um, I don't really, I don't think I can put the same amount of time into it that you can. So you be the one that is the main leader. I'll work together with you. Okay. And they just agreed like that. Okay. And so that doesn't mean that the second guy is inferior in any way. He just voluntarily chose, hey, I'll work together with you on this project, okay? I think it's that sort of notion. And so when we say between Jesus and the Father, uh, this is a voluntary relationship. Jesus is equal, but he voluntarily chose himself to submit to the Father. It's just that kind of idea in there. It's a good question. Uh, last question I see here. Is it theologically correct to say... For a New Testament believer, the God the Father is my Savior. Absolutely. Right on. Totally. 100%. No problem there at all. Just because of these passages that we have that talk about uh, God, our Savior, and Jesus Christ. Make it very clear that God the Father is our Savior. And then, yes, I, I'll follow up here. Our comment, our discussion earlier about um, Israel calling them God, God their Father. When Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, uh, Our Father which art in heaven, that would have been very shocking language. But it's back to my concept earlier, union with Christ. Jesus says, My Father, My Father. And then he's, he's basically inviting the disciples. You disciples can also call God your Father. And so now it's not just My Father, Jesus' Father, but it's Our Father, which is, whoa, mind-blowing. So when you put that together, yes, a New Testament believer, God the Father is my Savior. It's good. Okay, good. Jennifer, good uh, follow-up here, though. Jennifer just commented, Redemption, salvation is an act of the Trinity, but we cannot say that God the Father died for my sin. And good. What you're getting into, I don't want to go too far because we're going to go into Trinitarian theology, and we're trying to kind of stay a little more focused here, but it's excellent, right? This is where we're careful, right? So we say God is my savior the father is my savior but there are things you shouldn't say god the father did not die on the cross right jesus did not come at pentecost okay so there are things that are specific to that person and you don't want to mix those levels up um okay danielle asked here why are there arguments about the level of authority between the father and jesus not really about the holy spirit um, and the answer to your question is just, we just don't have enough passages that point us that way. I don't know that there's significance to it. Um, there's, you could do an argument out of John 14, the Father and the Son send the Spirit. So since they send the Spirit, then there seems to be that same order, Father, Son, Spirit is going on there. There's just not enough passages that really explore that, that we're able to build up much of a theology there. So I think we just end up stopping there because we can't go any further. Um, okay, good. Someone asked Catholics sometimes in their prayers say Papa Jesus, and it always makes me cringe. What can you say about that? Excellent. Really, really excellent. Because what's going on there is you're mixing up the roles, right? The Father and Jesus, but the Father and the Son. So then to say Father Jesus, 
anyway, you've just mixed up the you've mis mixed up the biblical language. You've just distorted the language. It doesn't even make sense, right? So anyway, something's gone off there, and I, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not deep enough into Catholic theology to explore this, but I suspect that some of the Trinitarian roles are getting mixed up because what's underneath going on with Catholicism is that Mary has taken the place of Jesus. Mary is now the mediator. So the way it's supposed to work is God the Father, Jesus is the mediator, fully God, fully man. So God the Father, me, Jesus is the mediator. What's happened is Catholicism actually uh, originally, out of an attempt to exalt Jesus, brings Mary in as the mediator to stand between me and Jesus. And Mary ends up kind of functioning as a new Jesus. She ends up replacing him, more or less. It wouldn't surprise me then if this Papa Jesus concept is almost like putting Jesus in the role of the Father. It's just a total, everything's gone to pieces. It's a mess. Just because it's completely, completely misunderstanding of the proper understanding of the Trinity. And I think that's probably because of the Mary thing that's driving some of that. Um, all right, another question. Is it correct to say that Christ willingly, voluntarily did not exercise his omniscience? Correct. We will come back to this later on. We see passages where Jesus says I, he does not know the day or the hour, and that is the explanation for that, uh, which is what we're already talking about here. Jesus voluntarily set aside his exercise of his power, which is maybe a good transition. That transition right there, that question, these, thank you for all of these excellent, excellent questions, takes us back to our chapter. Let's just grant, glance through here the person of Christ, and try to get the big picture view of what's going on here. What we're trying to understand here is, who is Jesus? And our, our basic notion is, Jesus Christ is fully God, fully man. Jesus Christ is fully God, fully man. I've tried to express this before in classes to say, Jesus Christ is 100% God, 100% man. Okay, so critical that you get this. It's not that Jesus Christ is 50% human and 50% God. Jesus Christ is fully human, fully God. You get that distinction. Jesus Christ is fully human, fully God. He is, another way to say it, he is as human as I am human and as God as the Father is God. Okay, hear that again? Jesus Christ is 100% just as human as I am human. It's not like I am more human than he is. He's completely 100% human and 100% God, just as much as God is God. Okay. Now, how would that work out? What I'm going to do here in the chapter, and if you end up reading this this week, you'll see. I'm going to first argue that Jesus Christ is fully God. And we see this with things like eternal pre-existence. What that means, existence, so meron, he exists, pre. Bago sa lahat, chay meron. He exists. He exists before everything else. And you can see this, that Jesus existed before, even in the Old Testament. You can see these statements of his existence. You keep on going. You see these titles, Emmanuel, Son of God, Christ, Messiah, Jesus, Lord, the Lamb of God, the Word. Uh, and then I've got this uh, excursus, it just means, uh, lang. <laughs> parenthesis, okay? And this is the angel of the Lord discussion. You'll do a little bit of work, I think, on that as a project. Then we talk about the incarnation, and here's where we're seeing the two sides. Jesus Christ is fully God. I'm giving evidence for why Jesus Christ is fully God. Five points that prove that he is fully God followed by Jesus Christ is fully man. And another five points that argue that Jesus Christ is fully man, why that has to be, okay? But that's going to be a struggle now. Here's the last statement. Jesus is one person. He's not, it's not like he's half, it's not like half of him, this half or something is human, and this half of him is divine. It's not like that. He's not split or something. He's one person. So all of him is fully God. All of him is fully man. Or I said earlier, 100%, 100%, which is a violation of math, <laughs> because you can 100% already means everything right. <laughs> so there you're starting to struggle. And that's where the struggles are going to come in here. I just start talking about 
some of the false ideas that have gone around. These are heresies. When people try to understand, wait, Jesus Christ is fully God, fully man. We're back to the magnet thing. They're trying to put these two pieces together, and the two pieces just won't, they won't stick together, right? Because the magnets don't match up. Okay. And so they come up with these errors. And some of these errors, you'll recognize, this is a, a big name for Iglesia Ni Cristo, or Jehovah's Witness, people that deny that Jesus Christ is really God. Right? That's the name for them, Arianism. Um, so I'm giving the different errors, and then after that I'm going to talk about the way you can understand the Incarnation, some of the ideas you should know. For instance, Christ voluntarily limited himself. Uh, number two, Jesus, two natures in one person. And this is kind of a graphic way to try to explain how those pieces fit together. And then uh, we talk about the Incarnation and why it matters, why it's such an important doctrine. Uh, the significance or the practical significance it has for our lives. Okay, that's what we'll talk about next time. And we'll have discussion just to try to answer some of these questions. Some of the things you were uh, saying um, earlier, things like, well, okay, so how can Jesus Christ, how can he not know everything if he's fully God, right? Well, that's hard, right? I mean, if he's, if he's fully God, he should be omniscient. And yet he says there were things he did not know. Right. So those kinds of difficulties are things we'll talk about next time. All right, any questions just before we go? All right. Um, recalling for our preparation for next week, um, we have this, just remembering the schedule and our plans there. Oh, where did it go? Here it is. Um, so the idea I'm hoping is that over this next week, you will try to read through the chapter we just discussed. And we just discussed it. Now reading through kind of gives you another layer so that you, oh, okay, these pieces can hopefully go together. So read through the chapter on the Father. And then you have these study questions down here. I've already talked about a lot of these in our discussion. So it's just an opportunity to kind of summarize Again, I, I think what happens, you hear it, then you read it, then you write about it, and by the time you get done three different channels, hearing, reading, writing, I'm hoping it'll stick. I think it sticks better <laughs> if you have it that way. So even if you're, if you're doing this for credit or even for audit, I would encourage you, if you can, take a little time and actually write out your answers here. I know that you could think them, but writing them out, you're going you're gonna to learn better. You're going to remember more if you can get the chance to write them out. Okay. So you have those questions, and if you're able to read the chapter and answer those study questions, the other thing you could do separately is this project on the Angel of the Lord. I think, I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, it's there, the documents are there in the Dropbox for you to, to download, and you can have the passages that I talked about all in translation, just in one document, you just read through it. So it's, it's not too much time to find and look through the documents, and then you're just following these instructions down here um, to write up the Angel of the Lord project, okay? One page or half page is fine if you're not taking it as a program student. So I, th I think, I hope, I trust this could be a doable uh, homework project assignment for you for this week. And next week we'll pick up the person of Christ and keep on going. All right, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, yes, good question. Ate Irina asked us here, asked, excuse me, asked me here, do we also have a quiz? I will put up a kind of a review quiz, and the distinction I'll make here is if you are a program student, it's required. So if you plan to use this towards your program degree at BJMBC, then you take that quiz and it's a required thing. If you want to take it, or yes, and uh, someone asked me here, maybe in the future I might be a program student. If you think there's a chance in the future, please do also. That'll be better for you in the future. Um, if you are just taking this for audit, or if you're taking it as uh, continuing education for all, you're not a program student, then it's optional, but I'd love for you to take it. I think taking it might be a good review. And um, all it is, it's going to be from those seven questions. So if you already did your homework, you, you study those cards, it's easy. I think it's very, very doable. Okay? 
Um, I forgot to create the link before class, so I'll have to email it to you separately. So just watch for an email and I can get that to you later on today. And then just by next week before class, you can take that as a review, you can take it optionally, or if you're a program student as a requirement. So it's good. Thank you for that uh, good reminder. Good. All right, uh, there was a question here and I will have to save it for next week. Um, someone asked me here, what does it mean Christ be God by the Father? So we'll have to bring that up next week and I'll put a note so that I don't forget to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you all for your time, your interest. I'll stay on here for a few minutes. And if you want to discuss or chat about anything, I'm, I'm here. I'm happy to chat with you. Um, but otherwise, I'll look forward to seeing you next week, same time. And then just message anytime if you have any questions or problems. Okay. Thanks all. Have a good day.